Riddle me this, pod fans. What's 90 minutes long arrives every Friday and is all about the Cape Crusader? Why it's blabbing about Batman, the animated series, the newest Patreon-exclusive podcast miniseries on the Talking Simpsons Network. That's right. For the rest of 2021, we'll be covering our 10 favorite episodes of Batman, the animated series, with the same heavy-duty research, clips, and trivia you've come to expect from us. And if you sign up at the $5 level today at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons, you'll get to hear each episode as soon as it goes live. Remember, sign up at patreon.com slash talking simpsons to hear all 10 episodes of blab about batman the animated series as well as the 100 plus other exclusive podcast episodes we produce so far so become a patron and join us through the rest of 2021 for another great mini series same bat day same bat podcast feed i heartily endorse this event or product Ahoy hoy everybody and welcome to Talking Simpsons, the home of knifey wifey. I'm your host, Party Robot Bob Mackey, and this is our chronological exploration of The Simpsons, who is here with me today as always. Why, it's Henry Gilbert, and save it for Dateline Tuesday. And who do we have on the line? Me am Nina Matsumoto, Canada call from. <laughs> and this week's episode is Trilogy of Error. Son of a diddly. This week's episode aired on April 29th, 2001, and as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real world history. (gasps) Oh my god! Oh boy, Bobby. Giant film fiasco, town and country, bombs at the theaters, Jane's Addiction headlines the second ever Coachella Music Festival, and Robert Downey Jr. is arrested for alleged drug use in Los Angeles days before he is about to have a court hearing about his previous arrest for alleged drug use. Mm, that's yes. the end of him. Yeah. <laughs> Never heard from him again. As, as Robert Downey Jr. tells the tale, this was the arrest that set him straight, that mm. he was was like oh this this is rock bottom being arrested while i am waiting for uh, to go to court for my previous arrest i am i am gonna <laughs> clean myself up and, and he apparently has and like all drug offenders he was given multiple chances and allowed to have a uh, you know fabulous movie career yes. afterwards very limited time in jail he actually was the rare one where he actually did go to jail briefly mm-hmm. I'm a, I'm a rare one i mean rare celebrity yeah not um, not normal person who got mandatory minimums for her for like the first time rdj was arrested a person would be in jail for 20 years for what he did but yeah uh, when he was first announced to play iron man i don't know henry do you remember if people said like oh i can't imagine him as iron man, iron man because i thought he'd be perfect because of all these uh substance abuse problems he'd be having yes i actually i did think the same thing because uh iron man famously in the comics is an alcoholic and has struggled with alcohol abuse so i figure like oh that'll be an interesting thing they can you know actually journey through his character with but then they didn't really do that in his movies though no they you know? didn't yeah. they still haven't yeah but they kind of look a ptsd thing in yeah movie, but beyond that like i really thought that was gonna be the the one where they tackle his uh, alcoholism but yeah. no they didn't go for it for some reason yeah in in the second movie i remember there were in the first trailer for the second movie there's like him drunk djing in his iron man suit and i thought like oh this is rock bottom on his alcoholism and deal with it but i think it, i think it was the they wanted Tony Stark to be a fun guy who could just make a cocktail and say something funny while drinking and go like, or no, his most famous one is in like in the first Avengers movie where he's like making a drink as, as taunt as he's taunting Loki, like not a good plan while, while drinking something. So I think they just didn't want to get rid of that aspect of him. Uh, and maybe they also were like, ah, it's depressing to see a, a superhero get drunk in these aren't Marvel movies. You want to have fun. Mm, they can't be like real humans with uh, yeah. vices and sex drives. <laughs> it's, it's it nuts to think it would be seven years after this he would uh, become the most famous movie star for a time uh, thanks to Iron Man. Hmm. And Town and Country, not an Iron Man style hit. No. Uh, no. All the old movie stars were coming out to shine like Warren Beatty, uh, Diane Keaton, and uh, Goldie Hawn. And mm-hmm. we were trapped in the brief Josh Hartnett bubble. Oh yes, yeah. He was a we lot of At peak Hartnett in that time period. Where is he now? Probably doing something. Not dead, I know that uh, for sure. I know nothing about 
town and country? Does that have anything to do with TNC surf design? <laughs> no, uh, Thrilla no. Gorilla is not the star of this movie, which is why I didn't see it. <laughs> the funniest thing about it was I never saw the film, but I remember hearing about it as like, this film got delayed two years, that they did so many reshoots that it was somehow like $80 million or something, and you just look at like, but there's no special effects. It's just Warren Beatty and Diane Keaton, and they just keep filming it over and over again. <laughs> And then once it finally came out, I think it was one of those times where Warren Beatty thinks that he is still like like Robert Downey Jr., the most famous guy in the world. And actually, to most people, even in 2001, he was no longer a movie star and people didn't care. And I don't think Warren Beatty likes to admit that about himself. Oh, what is it even about? Uh, a town? You know, uh, rich people getting a divorce in mm. fancy houses. It's uh, <laughs> it's one of those like eh. divorce comedies of the 90s, where it was like, uh, like James L. Brooks, I think, did at least a couple of those. Like, divorce, funny, yeah. huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Directed by the man who directed uh, later in life, Hannah Montana, the movie. <laughs> So uh, a really profitable movie, actually. So uh -huh. that wasn't the end of him. <laughs> and, uh, and yes, the second Coachella with Jane's Addiction. That's, uh, you know, hey, they're they're good. I like Jane's Addiction. And mm -hmm. Coachella still, uh, what, they did? They brought it back this year. There was uh, Coachella has resumed. I thought Jane's Addiction was Lollapalooza. Well, I mean, this was also them going to Coachella. Okay, like, okay. But yes, you're right. They, I think the Jane's Addiction dude uh, founded uh, Lollapalooza. Yes, yeah. I am too old for music festivals because... <laughs> Uh, too much standing. Yeah, all that standing, the heat, yeah. And then uh, the, the, don't talk about the prices of, of food there either. I, I mostly see Coachella used as a, a punchline nowadays. <laughs> White women dressed as Native Americans, usually. <laughs> That's all I know it for. Yeah. <laughs> I only know it as a thing like millionaires go, or actually, no, when I think Coachella, my first thought is hologram performing. That's what I think. Yes. Yeah, so that's where all the holograms go. Yes. <laughs> uh, the greatest dead celebrities can be seen on stage and they're all blue. <laughs> but uh, joining us today is Nina Matsumoto, the Eisner Award winning comic artist and uh, also works for Fangamer, the video game merchandise company. And last but not least, she is my knifey wifey. <laughs> uh, I'm happy to be back and this is my my first time recording a podcast since i got my invisalign off so if, if the way i talked bothered anybody up to this point don't worry it's been fixed <laughs> no one has commented on it but now they're uh, going to go back and look for it listening. well i noticed i i feel like i've been lisping a lot or like sucking on my invisalign trays mm. during recordings i'll be i'll be the hell out of me <laughs> to make people feel better uh i'll be eating hard candy throughout the entire podcast <laughs> <laughs> uh it's uh, and, and also nina is an expert i mean listeners don't know by now i mean Nina is also an expert Simpsons illustrator, professionally so. I have questions about Simpsons fingernails and the drawing of them, especially, and uh, for this episode. Ooh, do we talk about that now, or when we, <laughs> we, we can wait till we get scene. to the severing yeah. of the finger? But yeah, also you are like uh, a super fan of both of the movies this episode draws from, are you not? Um, super fan. I mean, I, I just watched them for the first time in my life this month. Me oh, too. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. Thanks Actually, to no, Nina. No, uh, run, run, little run. We, we uh, Bob and I watched uh, a couple of months ago but we watched go for the first time last week mm -hmm. oh really wow so, yeah. uh, i like i like both of them a lot i can see why they were in, someone was inspired by both although more so go than run little little run which i'm sure we'll talk about later mm -hmm. uh but no like uh i just like this episode mostly i'm glad that like i haven't been on a season 12 uh episode of yours of talking simpsons yet so i'm glad i got the best season 12 episode it definitely objectively. is objectively yeah yes before, okay before anyone asks me like i yeah i say things <laughs> that are hyperbolic to show how strongly <laughs> i feel about a thing so take my statement with a grain of salt but for me this is the best one without question. Yeah, I think especially what makes it stand out is a hallmark of the Scully era is them joking about how little the plot matters. Like usually the third act will be none of this mattered and you're a dumb dumb if you expected it to matter in any way. Mm -hmm. Like on Simpsons Safari, we just recorded that. On the commentary, somebody asked, wait, how did this happen? And Mike Scully jokes, you actually care about the story? Yes. In yeah. this case, this episode stands out and it did at the time because the story really, really matters. And there are lots of great Simpsons episodes where the story doesn't matter. Or lots of really gag filled ones like I like like the PTA disbands itchy and scratchy land and so on they're not plot heavy they're gag heavy uh, but this one stands out because there were so few story focused episodes at this time and even in 2001 when people were extra grumpy about the Simpsons they still like this one the, yeah. all the cranky fans stopped being cranky for about a week because of this episode you know unless Simpsons Tall Tales the only one of this season I haven't rewatched yet 
unless that really disappoints or really impresses me more than i remember i agree that this is the best episode of season 12 because i it i re-watching it too i was like this is full of moments that have become memorable memes like that is a great you know uh metric to measure of an episode's you know cultural value and also yeah i think it's full of really funny stuff and it challenged them to actually give a shit about a plot mm-hmm. like i i think that that matters quite a lot at this time which yes. is why and we'll get to it, it uh, the ending is very weird because uh it's mr teeny saying this plot made no sense it makes the most sense that any plot in this show had made in four years yes <laughs> yeah, the, the ending is the only thing i don't like about this, this yeah. episode Whenever anyone implies anything past season nine or ten is garbage, I bring up this episode as proof that that's not true. And yeah, like it's not the funniest episode. It's not very like gag heavy, like Bob said. But like the the plot itself, like I love non linear storytelling. Like I can't get enough of it. I, I, it's because I get the same kind of satisfaction out of uh, out of non linear storytelling as I do from mystery stories mm-hmm. because. You know, you're gradually fed pieces of a puzzle and when everything makes sense and comes together at the end, it just feels great. And it's even better when I see the same scene happen from different points of view. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, I just love that. Yeah. In case you haven't seen the movies, they're worth watching. 1998's Run, Lola, Run and 1999's Go. By the way, Go is kind of hard to search for online. Sure like, Go yeah. movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, but you can find it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, in Run, Lola, Run, um, these are both like short movies, too. So they're really easy to watch. But Run, Lola, Run, it's basically like, uh, was it, you know, like three or four attempts at the same day the character goes through and each time like she's delayed or she advances a certain amount of time and that will change the things she meets along the way yeah it's uh, the same portion of time seen multiple times but done different times it's, it's almost like uh, she meets a bad end at each one so then she starts over again kind of like a video game it's very yes. video gamey which is why I think we liked it and there's uh, one little moment I wish they did more with in which she actually learns something from a previous timeline and uses that to her advantage it only happens once and I was like that is a really cool idea which they would have mm. done more with yeah I, I think it probably influenced a lot of the not that I think there were time loop video games before it but mm. it's one of those things with, especially with like bigger video games that you can see if there was a popular indie film or a cool indie film like like run lola run or foreign film but uh, what well, because but i guess it's a german film it's not foreign if you're in germany but you know what i mean it's one of those films that uh, uh just it becomes a thing that influences all these other creators in in video games like oh i could be a thing like now time loop video games are kind of its own like genre there's so many of them and uh like outer worlds i remember everybody was talking about that it's the outer wilds i always <laughs> Those two games there, released at the same time and they're yeah. very different with yeah. very similar names. Outer Wilds, yeah. And and recently there was just Deathloop. Yep, yep. Yeah. Plus uh yeah, you love those uh the 999 games, yeah, the Nonari games. Oh, yeah. Uh more Majora's Mask. Escape series. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a weird history with Run Lola Run because like back in like 1998 i was obsessed with the song believe from the soundtrack Mm -hmm. so i bought the cd and i listened to a lot but i could never find it for rental so i just kind of gave up on ever seeing the movie until a few months ago when i remembered it exists and uh i watched it with bob and i was it was so nice to like finally see (laughs) the movie and then to realize like oh this this episode is not really based on run a little run It kind of references it like once, but that's it. Mm -hmm. And then when we watched uh, Go last week, I was like, oh, this this episode is just Go, but done better. Yes, Selman uh, snarkily points out in the commentary, he did a better job than Go. (laughs) Because with Go, uh, the stories all start in the same place. And then uh, in the movie, each character has their own story. It's like three acts. And at the end, you see the ending of each one. And I will say, uh, throughout the characters' main stories, they maybe cross over like 5%. Is that fair to say, Nina? Yeah, like surprisingly very little. Like these yeah. are three completely different stories. And it gets the uh, filmmaker to be able to tell three different crime stories. Mm-hmm. And you were very right mm-hmm. to say, Nina, this is sort of like a light, more lighthearted version of a Tarantino movie because yeah. I think it's like kind of yeah. a subversion. I think you put that out, Nina. I don't want to steal your idea, but I think you said it was a subversion <laughs> of a Tarantino movie in that like in a Tarantino movie, these characters are put in these very, very desperate and terrible situations. But unlike in a Tarantino movie, no one gets killed or raped or disfigured. The endings are all very happy for mostly everybody and like uh, there's no murders and there's drugs in the movie but they're like fun drugs it's not like kill you drugs it's like ecstasy and weed and that's it so I feel like this is sort of Tarantino for teens even though it's rated R and it shouldn't be yeah when I uh, finished watching the movie my only complaint was that it felt like Tarantino for babies (laughs) yes Uh, it kind of is it's like junior Tarantino but 
yeah, then I realized, oh, there are all these scenes that felt very Tarantino-ish and you feel like something horrible is going to happen, like in a Tarantino film, but then it uh, it doesn't. So. Well, you know, after 1994, with when Pulp Fiction, you know, hit the mainstream, and I'd say, you know, even in 90, after 92 with Reservoir Dogs, most I- indie filmmakers were like, yeah, I'm going to be like Tarantino. I'm going to do a thing about criminals who then have conversations about the Smurfs or whatever. Like, yeah. that's, that, that, there was only one of those in the movie, and it was brief. There was like a, a two minute conversation about like, the family circle. You know, but I agree with Timothy Oliphant. Yeah. I just watched it last night, so this is all fresh in my head. Yeah, that uh, Timothy Oliphant's character complaining about how Family Circus is this shitty thing you get at the end of uh, having a good time reading the comic strip. I did feel that way all the mm. time in that movie. Now, I uh, I saw the movie when it was new. I did uh, on DVD, okay. not not in theaters, but it was because I had just really gotten into Dawson's Creek, and then oh. it was like, oh, Katie Holmes is in a movie. All right, I'll I, check that out. I, I joke with Nina before we started the movie, but like, oh boy, a Scott Wolf movie i'm yeah. excited and you know what he was he was fine in the movie <laughs> yeah no it's him- funny because i wanted to see this movie because it stars sarah Polly. Mm, right she's a bit of a like canadian darling oh okay i, I never I, really got a huge break but she i think she's a really good actor and I, lately she's uh, not really acting more so like a political activist which is also cool oh that's cool and she wrote a big uh story for something about harvey weinstein saying this is basically why you don't see me in a lot of things anymore uh, yeah. can you believe it that's sad that's and I, yeah well, when I saw it at the time, obviously I was a nerd who never touched drugs, but I was 19 and I did want to make out with Timothy Oliphant, so mm. I could identify with Katie Holmes in that <laughs> way. Watching it again, thinking about how like, you know, Scott Wolf is like this heartthrob on, on Party of Five and, you know, it wasn't a lot of actors would not play gay back then, you know, yeah, and yeah. that he, he just kind of went for it, though only Jay Moore kissed a man on screen. Scott mm-hmm. Wolf did not kiss a man, which that, I know that was a line for even care actors straight actors playing gay back then they'd be like look i'll play gay but i'm not kissing any any dude on the mouth well it could it could have been him but also could have been his agent yes that too bad look for you if you kissed a man yeah he does not kiss men in this movie but i but i i liked uh, the movie i think holds up pretty well it's full of but it is like Paul Fiction Jr. And yeah, every, you can just see a guy writing at his desk like I'm even funnier than Tarantino. I <laughs> I, I I write better stuff than him. it is by the the swingers director too. Yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, and I mean, uh, I, uh, speaking of Pulp Fiction, I think that was the first time I encountered non-linear storytelling hmm. where things kind of come together and intertwine. Yeah, that I was really. I remember being really impressed by that when for, I was young and saw that for the first time. For me, it was that one scene in Spaceballs. <laughs> them watching the VHS yes. tape in the movie still yeah. an amazing joke and uh, yeah so go recommended movie same with Run Lola Run go not a popular movie not a bomb but it would, mm. came and went no one really talks about it or remembers it that was the basis for the plot Matt Selman says if you come up to me and say I love that episode you did that parody Run Lola Run he says you're a dummy <laughs> it's actually a go parody and uh, this this episode because it's like we got this young hip Gen Xer writing this thing about go we need some old boomer references so the episode is named after the 1975 made for TV movie Trilogy of Terror uh, famous for the one segment in which Karen Black is chased around her apartment with a Zuni fetish doll sorry by a Zuni fetish doll holding a knife for 30 minutes Mm. just her and this doll one segment it traumatized an entire generation it's why there's the evil crusty doll episode of the treehouse yeah Yeah, that treehouse is not based on child's play by the way it's Mm. definitely a trilogy of terror uh, child's play just ripped that off also they both were inspired by the same thing yeah i no, i you know i didn't see run lola run until after seeing this episode because i think i slightly recognized the go-ness of it but even by 2001 go was kind of leaving my memory even but the running by lisa and this is so specifically that that i think i did hop online to be like it's run lola run so then then i rented it i would think within two months of seeing this episode and and then i hadn't watched it since and rewatching it i was like man this movie rules too but it's also another of those like it's about hip 90s 20 somethings doing crimes like mm-hmm, again mm-hmm. it wouldn't exist without tarantino and drugs i would think yeah it's about drugs and crime yes and, and being sweaty going going back to the episode title like i'm not going to translate all the, the season 12 oh. japanese titles but this one in japanese is trilogy thumb story <laughs> trilogy <laughs> trilogy thumb story. colon thumb story yeah oh that's good i like well, that no trilogy exclamation mark thumb story yes ah, okay uh it's thumb monogatari right <laughs> 
Yeah, Oyayobi Monogatari. That's one of You're the right. Japanese words I know because it's in a lot of titles mm. of video games and anime. And yes, uh, Matt Selman originally titled this story Go Simpsons Go to I, reference the movie Go. I wish he'd gotten to keep that as a title. But That's it, a better title for this. Yeah. yeah. So, though, the, yeah, actually, yeah, I wanted to super duper compliment Matt Selman, actually, because this episode, I think, totally shows why he got to be a showrunner on the show and one of the more like influential writers on the show in the last like decade you know i i never really considered it until we it's time to talk about the the table read but <laughs> but seriously when we went to that table read it was a gimmick episode run by matt selman yeah and i think he's really invested in like trying to do cool gimmick episodes like so many of the new ones i've watched when they're other not just the cincinnati one but also like the even the one that makes homer a, a 90s teen the gimmick is it's like the first act is set in the 90s and then the rest of the episode spins out of that or like the musical gimmick episode that was a season premiere i appreciate how much selman challenges at least the show's structure in a way and that kind of really starts here i think uh this episode being such a success for selman i think inspired him or like maybe made his name in the room of like oh this guy actually tries really hard maybe Mm -hmm. and he's sticking around for 10 years another 10 years let's uh why don't we make him co show he he seems like super proud of this episode and rightfully so like five years ago i've had a tweet by him uh from five years ago where he says after i pitched trilogy of error the other writers reacted with sobs of joy that such a wonder had come into this world (laughs) (laughs) i'm Uh, sure he's being a little bit sarcastic but uh uh, i think he he is confident about this and i think he said it's it's his best episode that he's written Mm, i would say i would bet so yeah Yeah. and i think too uh another reason that makes this one of his better ones was that i think selman is one of the most outspoken guys who was wished he was jealous of what south park was doing at the time and i think that infected some of his lesser scripts where he's like oh i tried to do like a south park turn or i wish i was as good as south park i wish i could go back in time and shake him to be like you're on simpsons that's not the same like don't feel like you're not as good as south park Speaking of South Park influence, it definitely influenced the story that didn't make it into the show. Lisa's yes. story was going to be her getting on the uh, the short bus, as it's known, instead of the normal bus, meeting a bunch of characters with hilarious disabilities that actually gave them kind of superpowers. Mm. Not more was said oh, about no. it, but he said it was considered too radical. Uh, I was joking with Henry. I think Macarena was like helicoptered in for Futurama <laughs> to like throw <laughs> Selman against the wall and saying, "What are you doing?" Yeah, I feel like there's oh, going to be a lot of uh, you know our funny R word uh, humor in that. That's, uh, I mean, it was I'm 2001. I'm so glad it didn't go that way. Yeah. I'm really glad. Hearing that short bus story he tells, I'm like, I'm so happy they didn't do that. Like, it, But that is so like, that's Jimmy and Timmy on South Park at the time, which was, yeah. you know, the style at the time, as old grandpa would say. But I, I do think um, Lisa's story is the weakest. Mm. but at least he didn't go there i'm glad she at least hung out with you know they gave i'd rather lisa get another crush than have to be on the short bus that's uh, i i'm glad they didn't go there also it's funny hearing selman one that he's very proud of the work he did on it on the commentary but also that he says like oh also when it went time to table read and rewrite i went on vacation like yeah. see you suckers they like, wrote the third act without him because he was gone <laughs> uh, but he's happy with the results yeah yeah and i think the gimmick for forced them to give a shit about the plot more than they did this whole season you know and i think my, i also uh, just overall blanket compliment to mike b anderson and his team like mm-hmm. this is a complex episode animation wise not just that it's a bunch of complicated action sequences but also like timing and bits have to go back on each other and and if you fudge something in act one it actually will fuck up a reveal in act two or act three so you can't mess around with that yeah yeah. Yeah. They also had to write scenes that you wouldn't mind seeing over and over again. Mm-hmm. And uh, even uh, I'll, I'd listen to Son of a Diddly every morning. I love <laughs> the though ants and picnickers meet, reach last minute accord. That joke, I'm like, eh, eh that, that's the weaker of the three peated jokes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The Simpsons will be right back. Presenting TGI Friday's special mouth-watering Christmas appetizer. Hmm? The holiday sampler platter. Mmm, platter. Spicy tangy buffalo wings. Mmm, buffalo. 
fried mozzarella and loaded potato skins. <laughs> Bring the family and friends. Who cares about them? Give me, give me, give me. Christmas and TGI Fridays. Everyone looks forward to Fridays. Offer not available to cartoon characters. No! Welcome to the break for an episode as valuable as a bunch of firecrackers. And a big thank you to our guest this week, Nina Matsumoto. We always love having her on, our wonderful artist for the series, and our good friend too. Follow her on Twitter, at Space Coyote, with an L at the end on it. And check out her amazing comic series with Ian Boothby, Sparks, the third volume coming out soon. And if you enjoy this podcast, well, you really should be checking out what we do at Patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons, because that's how me and Bob do Talking Simpsons as our full-time job. Thanks to support. Supporters and listeners there. If you sign up, you not only get to hear next week's episode of Talking Simpsons right now, but you also get to hear a giant back catalog of exclusive podcasts of us covering shows like Futurama, King of the Hill, Mission Hill, and The Critic, only if you are a $5 a patron. And right now, you could be hearing every Friday until the end of the year, our podcast covering our 10 favorite episodes of Batman the Animated Series. You can hear blabbing about Batman the Animated Series, the podcast, every week if you are a $5 and up subscriber. So please, Check it all out today at patreon.com slash talking sense. But if you want something even nicer than telling the difference between inflammable and flammable, you should check out our premium level at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons for $10 a month. You get all those $5 things and then you also get one extra super long exclusive premium podcast. That is the What a Cartoon Movie podcast. Like our sister podcast, What a Cartoon. We go super in-depth like on The Simpsons with a different animated feature film each month, often for over four hours long. Recent ones have included this month, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the holiday classic. Before that, we did a whole summer of Disney Renaissance, including The Lion King. And coming this month, coming next month, we'll be covering the Satoshi Kon masterpiece, Millennium Actress. We will go super in-depth into all those. You will have a good time. Please check it all out at patreon.com slash talking simpsons. Also, they were really addicted to fire jokes at this time, just because not only the explosion in this episode, but their chalkboard gag is also about burning things. Did, did Ned say fire is the cleanser at one point, and then like he burned his mustache off? Oh, yeah, yeah, when he got the um, the cooties on him from yeah. home. Yeah. Well, and also, they burn a book in this episode, too. It's, yeah. Uh, and, and the explosion, the flamble, like, yeah, it's, uh, they're really into burning at this time. Yeah, fire being a cleanser, is that a reference to anything from hmm. back then? Uh, it just feels boy. so specific it to just, call it a cleanser. If you're psychotically uh, obsessed with fire, uh, yeah. that's something you would be thinking. It's a, it's the cleanser. It will it will heal all. <laughs> My first thought, it, thought of is Rorschach from Watchmen saying the talking about the cleansing fire as he burned down this guy's house or whatever. <laughs> that's that's my first thought. But yes, we uh, we begin the episode with Homer's day, and and also on my first watch, I didn't get the gimmick till the start of Act Two. Like I, I'm not gonna act like I was so smart that I realized like, oh, it said Homer's day. This is gonna be interesting. I was just like Homer's day, okay. And I think too, maybe by this point, as I've said many times, my episodes made me mad at the end, so my opinion was going <laughs> lower and lower on Simpsons in season 12 so i didn't give them the credit of like oh this is going to be like a creative idea like a creative gimmick like 22 short films you know i i did not have that uh expectation for this episode well like nothing super weird happens until the very end of uh, the first act at which point mm. you're like huh what happened and then you see the gimmick in the yeah next act. yeah apparently they didn't want to do the repeated scene at the beginning but then they realized like no we need this to sell the idea mm. it, it uses up time yeah yeah they that's something too you're that anime there's a funny bit on it where Mike B. Anderson is asked, like, was this cheaper? And he's like, no, it actually somehow ended up being more expensive, even though we reused scenes. It was more expensive what? than the average episode. And then Al Jean has a funny joke of saying, like, it turns out every episode's more expensive than the average episode. Like, they, every episode's a higher budget. <laughs> 
Uh, so this episode takes place on March 21st. Mm, hmm. Ah, man. Specifically, because of a newspaper, it says that. You know what? I should save to my Twitter drafts now a viral tweet uh, for March Ooh, 21st of yes. next year. Yeah. Uh, it's but the year Marty McFly. Everybody. The year <laughs> Marty McFly went back in time. We can't do that anymore, and I'm sad now. No. It's too bad. But the episode begins with, uh, with Homer applying his deodorant. The sound of him putting stick deodorant below the belt is, uh, it still haunts me. And you know what? Listen, uh, this is, mm-hmm. again, another time that reality has outpaced satire or parody because uh i mean i don't begrudge anyone for having the manscape commercials on their podcast you got to do what you got to do to make money but when i hear the term ball deodorant i i have a lot of questions uh how how smelly all your are your balls uh i feel like if you're if your testicles are, are stinky enough to require some sort of applicant you just should get in the shower uh, in second shower time yeah. or you're not doing enough in the shower the first time it's Maybe. like you're applying the febreze philosophy to your body and that's not going to do it if anyone else is going to be going down there you want to be clean with soap and water yeah I, I think it's necessary like throughout the years there have been various like products sold to people to cover up the odor of their genitalia but i really don't think it's necessary in fact it's probably bad to apply anything in down there mm. it, it can be kind of sensitive itself it doesn't usually clean itself though i mean the sweat should deal with it i mean yeah, yeah. i yeah we have a we're gonna have a very detailed ball washing description right now <laughs> well uh, speaking of like uh just deal order in general like i never use it my mom never bought it for me or told it what it was so like it will like i never understood like what what it uh, was like to like use it like i've seen it i saw commercials but then it wasn't until like high school uh gym locker time that i saw that everybody used it and it felt like there was societal pressure to oh use yeah it. if you didn't use it you were seen as like stinking gross so i asked my mom like oh can you get me deodorant and she said uh you don't need it because you don't smell and I'm like, oh, okay. But then it turns out she was kind of right because I later found out uh, there's a specific gene that makes your earwax wet and your sweat stink. And the majority of Asians don't have this. Mm. Mm. My earwax is dry and I guess I I don't smell. This reminds me of my first trip to Japan for video game coverage. I, I went with a, a Japanese American man who, who warned me. He's like, you need to bring your own deodorant because you're not going to find powerful enough deodorant for your stink. In, <laughs> uh, for, for your white man stink when you're in Japan. So I, I, I can vouch yeah, for yeah, Nina's. I can vouch for Nina's claim. We spent a lot of time together very close and she has never smelled. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Bob. Thanks for confirming. Yeah, I have North American friends in Japan who will buy a stock of stick deodorant whenever they come back here to visit yeah he he warned me i and he was right i'm so glad uh, that he uh takeshi warned me about that i appreciate that but uh but yeah homer i think homer's enjoying this application of the roller as well mm-hmm. i think i think there's some fun for him uh also i just love hearing julie's breakfast like so Mac- so macaraining loved it he wants a yeah. doll that does that on the <laughs> so commentary he was saying that uh, i'm glad we hear it three times in this episode and uh, we get to see Homer. It's funny. Homer hears breakfast. You think he's going to run naked all the way there. But I guess in his nude run out of the bathroom, he runs to the bedroom and puts on clothes. But obviously, it'd be it'd be weird if Homer was nude for the next like five scenes <laughs> after this. So I understand why. Uh, but yes, we then head to the breakfast table and Marge has a surprise for them. It's uh, a special cereal. I've never had muse lakes. Have you guys had it? At, yes. Is it is it gooey? Yeah. No, it's not no, gooey. It's not. Okay. Which is why I never understood I, this joke. And I, sorry, Nina, I love yeah. muse lakes. Go ahead, Nina. Mm. No, you go ahead. I love Explain it. What music is like? It's just like the cereal I liked the most growing up. It was just like basically trail mix in a box. And that's what mm. muse lakes is. Okay. So I don't know where I get, the, get this joke where it's sticky. Yeah, I don't understand it. I've mm. I've not had when I looked at the box of muse lakes. I was like, well, I've never had that, but I've had several kashi cereals yeah. and other healthy cereals that are just you know really a collection of nuts and berries and not not the usual sugar delivery system that americans <laughs> associate with sugar uh, cereal as as we call it yeah yeah M- muslix is kind of similar to the cashew stuff it's just like cornflakes with some dried fruit and oats in it mm-hmm. and what Morge has is more like oatmeal like cartoony oatmeal so it's sticky as well as yeah well as goopy. this this feels like as we've said many times in the scully years this feels like husbands complaining about a thing a wife <laughs> bought that they don't like and that may that they made them eat they That's weren't what it feels they like. weren't made a plate full of bacon <laughs> yeah also well. the name is just funny it is oh, muse licks yeah. uh, and yeah. juice licks yeah. juice licks uh and it's also the weird that lisa hates it too you would think she would like the the healthy cereal but she can't stand it either and they're all looking for excuses at the breakfast table in our first clip uh, cereal 
You know I like my breakfast fried or chicken fried. It's a healthy cereal from Europe. Muselix. <laughs> they also make Juicelix. <laughs> it's Millhouse. And it sounds like he has big news. Yeah. yeah. I'll get us out of this. Say, Dad, want to go see my project for the school science fair? No, Lisa. But I sure don't want to eat this crappy breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Linguo, the grammar robot. I built him all by myself. If you misuse language, he'll correct you. Well, let's put him to the test. Me love beer. I love beer. Oh, he loves beer. Here, little fella. Dad, no! Geror. I'm sorry. I thought he was a party robot. Oh, this is why I can't have nice things. This is a new level of dumb for Homer. That The Lingwo is repeating back what Homer just said, and then Homer <laughs> pours beer into a robot's mouth. Like, to be fair, he's, he's uh, saying something slightly different, so maybe Homer is like, well, this is what the robot thinks. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, it was Bender. <laughs> exactly. It looks a bit like Bender. Yeah, I think the connection with Trilogy of uh, Terror is that there is a little doll kind of thing sure, running around. Sure. I, as, as they remark on the commentary, this is an, also a new level of brilliance for Lisa. Mm -hmm. Like, Lisa, uh, in, in the Bully episode... I, I noted that I thought it was good that they made it like, oh, it's salad dressing. So Lisa didn't like invent this, the anti-bully spray. She just discovered that salad dressing does it. So she's not, you know, full on Professor Frank. In this episode, she is equal to Professor Frank in building AI and, <laughs> and full robotics. But it's really a very Lisa style thing to invent a sunny robot. And all it does is correct your grammar. That's true. Yeah. I, I love Linguo. Uh, when this episode first came out, I was like a huge stickler for grammar. For grammar mm. correct grammar and i still am to some extent but i i now understand there's a time and a place for bad grammar and it's fine on twitter to use bad grammar for comedic emphasis or in a in a humor comic uh but i, I do think professional signs need good grammar or else it drives me crazy mm -hmm. for example mm. i can't stand comma splices which i see all the time or improper use of an apostrophe uh but i can let it go on twitter <laughs> i i'm glad you've if you correct grammar on twitter you are you're in the wrong yeah you're not playing the game right mm -mm. if you're doing that yeah i uh no i uh, i yeah lingual well, i mean this was at the time of the uh grammar nazi term was being yeah. thrown around <laughs> a lot back then so uh that's that's kind of what lingual well is i i was also shocked to see they they say on the commentary they're like oh we should make a toy a lingual well. Based on my search of Simpsons merchandise databases and of eBay, they're, they still have not made a Linguo toy of, like, not even a Linguo Funko Pop, which they make one of those for everything. They were just launching that, like, World of Simpsons uh, Playmates toys, the line of every, action figures of every character, seemingly, mm, at I, least the important ones. Even, even minor, like, variants of ones, like Resort Smithers, <laughs> they had. Uh, but no yeah, Linguo. Linguo never really took off. Like, there aren't really even memes of Linguo. Do you oh. see many memes of Linguo? The one that's behind Bob's head of Homer closing the eyes on the linguo. I see that one a lot around around the feed. I do see that. Uh, do you see it being posted? That yeah. image being posted? Or do you just do you see variants of that? Uh, I guess more variants, but I, I've seen it used in like a good night, sweet prince kind of thing of turning out the eyes. <laughs> like I, I've seen it from time to time. But yeah, I guess linguo is not as beloved as say you know any anything from seasons one through eight. No, I, I wouldn't yeah. say that. No, I want to I want to see more like remixed stuff <laughs> with linguo in it i don't know what it could be but maybe people just found him too annoying <laughs> <laughs> i will say linguo does appear in the ds version of the simpsons game in a pokemon parody oh that's fun where he's sort of like a pokemon oh that's clever i had that game i didn't get very far in it though I should, yeah, I was just seeing that one in my feed again because people pointed out the soundtrack sounds like a Dragon Quest game. Yeah. Which, also, in the whole winking thing, it's a really funny sequence of Homer just not getting it and just he's winking to Lisa, but then winks to Marge. But there's something about the scene of when Homer says that crappy breakfast, it's framed with Marge in the middle. Yeah. And it actually just feels so bad for Marge. He's like, I tried to make a nice <laughs> breakfast and I have to hear from you like my breakfast is crappy. Like that it's that's an interesting like choice to make you feel bad for Marge. And they could have easily just shown her face being like mad, but instead she's just like hurt. She's yeah. Like, oh. oh. 
<laughs> At least she didn't make it. She just made the choice to buy this. That's and, true. I guess prepare it for the family. She she just poured stuff into a bowl, so I can I I understand it. At least it's not much wasted time by her. Yeah. And yeah, the uh, Lisa Lisa runs upstairs, and so Homer is then uh, completely doesn't even care that Lisa is upset. He's quickly distracted by a new scent in the air, and uh, yeah, so oh boy, I I one thing that really it fills me with anxiety whenever i see it on tv it is kitchen accidents like Mm -hmm. stories about uh homer falling down a ravine like homer has gone through so many horrible injuries even like the realism of the way they drew his intestines sticking out of his body when a badger ripped apart his chest that didn't gross me out as much as this sequence here yeah yeah i mean uh there are many things that can kill you in your own home in fact uh, i don't want to say who this was because uh, i don't want to be tasteless but uh a famous uh, comedian died recently and i was like well how did he die an accident in the home it wasn't Uh, said how it doesn't wasn't said what happened but it could have been somebody tripped down the stairs it could have been somebody cut themselves it could have been any number of things so yeah it's like we don't think about it mm, I but slip in the shower tomorrow oh god i'd be killed <laughs> yes exactly wow, you could wake thumb. up dead tomorrow <laughs> sorry nina i sliced my thumb recently cutting <gasps> a bagel in half and that's why bob bought me a, ba- a bagel gear yeah mm. yeah i will put nina on blast because she cuts things too recklessly and i'm just like slow down slow down uh, i well, love to use a knife yeah well, she's my knifey wifey that's funny i <laughs> it's it, true. with me and my husband i am the nina in that scenario with knives because i i use knives pretty recklessly recklessly sometimes in the kitchen and my husband actually is like i can't be in the kitchen watching you cut things i'll just be i'll be over here just tell me when you're done cutting stuff i had a kitchen accident of cutting the web of my uh hand in the last year which uh which was my fault and entirely just me going like eh, i can just rush through cutting this thing like uh ow like yeah. that's hard to heal uh yeah it's you always know. moving i glued it back though it all it all <laughs> I, I went to a doctor and the doctor told me what to do i didn't just like pull out the super glue you, you know they, they make like heavy duty uh gloves you can wear in the kitchen mm-hmm. while you're cutting things uh well maybe that's what you need they're very flexible maybe so it's like wearing chain mail on your hands <laughs> Ooh, that sounds if if you told it to me it was like oh it's like mithril like frodo wears i'd be like okay that's cool yeah. i'll oh, do it yeah henry it's like you, you can feel like you're a frodo while <laughs> cutting things in the kitchen oh man i you know then if i get that then i should also get a knife that looks like his blade sting which lights up blue when orcs are near <laughs> okay this is yes. getting out of hand yeah so. yeah <laughs> uh but yeah nina you can attest to the power of the bagel guillotine isn't it amazing it is amazing I really don't like having lots of little kitchen peripherals that do one thing, but I'll give this one a pass. And, uh, I guess you could use it for like cigars too, right? I mean, to to bisect a cigar? Uh, oh, I uh, mean just the front side of the cigar, just chop. Oh off no, you put you put the bagel inside the compartment, then you put the blade uh, down on it. Okay, it's great. Yeah. If you try to cut anything else in there, uh, the bagel police will get you. Yes. <laughs> uh, but unfortunately, Homer and Marge did not have a uh, brownie cutting device. Instead, accidents happen. Oh, oh he shoots. He shoots. Ah! 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 Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh, 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 sorry not to put thumbs on the hand, Marge. Well, calm down. If we hurry, they can reattach your thumb. Reattach your thumb? This isn't Gattaca. You just gotta get your thumb to the... <gasps> Where did it go? Okay, boy. Drop the thumb. Nobody's gonna tackle you. No! Oh! Come back with my thumb! 911, this better be good. I cut off my husband's thumb. Attempted murder? Y'all burn for this. Burn in jail. It was an accident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Save it for Dateline Tuesday. Uh, what's your address so I can come arrest you? Arrest me? Um, my address. It's, um, one, two, three, fake street. One, two, three, fake street. Got it. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, just see, even hearing it, just like, uh. Marge was cutting those brownies with, like, a bone saw or something to just yeah. sever sever the thumb completely. You don't need that much effort to uh, cut a brownie either. Yeah. <laughs> I don't really understand the, the Gattaca reference. I'm guessing, you know, it's been a long time since I've seen Gattaca, but Gattaca is about eugenics, not really, you know, uh, reattaching limbs or anything. I'm guessing it's just 
Homer said a sci-fi thing and instead of like Star Trek, it, the joke is he's mentioning a thing no one even in 2001 remembers, the mm-hmm. 1997 film Gattaca. That, that's how I read it as. And I have some uh, Dateline trivia that's been lost to time. Oh boy. So when this episode was written, Dateline NBC was airing five nights a week. Good. Go five over. nights a wow. week. And because well, what viewers were getting just worn down by the amount of Dateline, they eventually removed the Tuesday spot in 2004. But Tuesday was the first time slot for Dateline NBC. Wow. Man. And uh, famous, most famous, I think, in history for its To Catch a Predator uh, segment. Sure. Which, yes. uh, it, you know, very polarizing mm-hmm. because uh, as much as i am not pro pedophile i'd also don't like police entrapment either uh, so predators should be caught but also there shouldn't be police entrapment the tv show yes i think, yes. I think that's bad yes you know I, bob mackie not pro pedophile exactly yes. your record yeah. saying this now the the show i i remember watching the first couple of those catch a predators when they were new and thinking like this this show is you're trying to make it comedic you're making this like this is not sober news journalism like there's there's at least uh, 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 like 10% candid camera in there that I'm like come on you can't you can't act like this is so serious we have to catch them and then it's also like can you believe this guy brought this what the I yeah I I guess what Wiggum is referencing is how Dateline does a lot of stories of spousal murder mm-hmm. like they're so uh, Bill Hader on Saturday Night Live he did a great sketch about how much he loves these shows of Dateline because they're just so trashy and the host of it is just like like, oh, and then what did you do? Oh, did you kill him? That's <laughs> right. Ooh, uh, look, uh, look at Bill Hader Dateline, mm. one of the my favorite SNL sketches of the last decade. And yeah, the Homer just running around with his blood flying out. Like I, I guess too in my first viewing, this made me. I, I'm surprised. I when I already <laughs> was feeling like, boy, Simpsons just did that diamond mine thing at the end of the last episode, and now I got to watch a severed thumb. I'm impressed with myself for not turning it off. I am too. I, <laughs> it's a and, lot of blood just yeah squirting out of there homer I, um should die of blood loss i'd say <laughs> i would say it's a realistic amount of blood i get they do bandage it up pretty yeah. fast yeah uh and you know the and, fingernail on there i guess we could talk about that uh that was put on there to indicate that it is a finger uh because it looked too much like a penis a severed penis uh otherwise yes. uh sorry nina go ahead that's what i was gonna say okay <laughs> well yeah i was ready for nina's expert opinion on not only the drawing of fingernails or the fingers on simpsons and rules for that but also like was well, bob came up with his own expert opinion no that was that what they said on the commentary that's what like uh, the director uh, mike b anderson is that who directed yes. this yeah you stole it from the commentary i did no, that was, i was thinking the exact same thing when i was watching it i'm like oh i know why they had to put that there this is the second time i've been on an episode that had a uh, simpsons fingernail in it oh right this one was um road to cincinnati that's a close up on the fingernails and we're like oh wow some rare fingernails i i remember when we did love in the fast lane that was people pointed out like in the weird shot of homer like shove uh, eating his steak very sloppily you they did draw fingernails on him in yeah. that shot and it's oh, very yeah. distracting that one disturbs me Th- <laughs> that was not necessary those fingernails i don't know like how that got past mac graining <laughs> it was season one well it's <laughs> that's like that's true yeah. it, it's a thumbnail and also like the ridges on the knuckle too that are uh, basically never yeah. drawn on a simpsons finger yeah too detailed <laughs> And I guess the the finger cutting thing um, reminded me of Michael Moore's Sicko. And I know his documenting style is flawed, but that was the the documentary that opened my eyes to just how brutal the American healthcare system can be. And uh, one case that stood out to me is a man who accidentally sawed off two of his fingers and he had no insurance. So he could reattach his ring finger for uh, 12K or his middle finger for 60K. And he chose his uh, ring finger because he's a uh, he's romantic and he wants to wear his wedding ring. <laughs> oh, geez. Make us an man. offer. <laughs> yeah. Can I get the combo pack? And he's gonna. Turn. I imagine a thumb would be the most expensive one. Yes. Yeah. I. Uh, that. That's why I used to, as a kid, laugh at like, oh, why would Hibbert not help him later in the episode? And now I'm like, oh no, I, it's actually brutally realistic. Uh, <laughs> it's it's funny when you go to the doctor or even dentist saying uh, before the procedure, before whatever you're uh, getting done happens, when you ask how much will this cost the answer is usually we don't know yes <laughs> you'll find out we don't know till it happens yeah, yeah. Now, i i had a thing where i went to a do- i i had my 
job insurance run out one time uh after leaving a job and i thought it was good for like another month but it wasn't and when i went to the doctor but i had an appointment that day and i said okay well can i I, i'll pay it how much is it and the person at the reception is like literally i don't know this Mm -hmm. will cost if you agree to do this it will cost whatever it will cost and you will you're asking for a blank check to be attached to your name and it will be whatever debt we say it is and and i of course canceled my appointment that day i was like great good (laughs) good for me like yay yeah but yeah i guess too this the the violence of it it hits harder because it's not a tree house either you know like this is all this blood and it isn't a tree house and and of course i've said it many times but i'm still scarred by watching the homer eats himself tree house oh, like that it's it's only five years old but i i don't think i'll ever get over <laughs> watching have, homer eat himself that must have really affected you because you keep saying that it gets me every <laughs> well bringing that up that episode starts very similarly with similarly where homer cuts a finger off while cooking and mm-hmm. then he eats the finger and so uh, yeah i will yeah. say this is uh slightly on topic but nina and i watched a lot of treehouse of horrors last time we were together because you know it was october and one trend i noticed is that they are extremely violent from a certain point onwards uh, like unnecessarily so usually in the past uh like within the first uh, 10 or 12 seasons there'll be one slightly shocking moment of violence per act there's just like countless heads being lopped off yeah. and blood squirting sideshow bob wearing bart's like intestines as a as a scarf that was a lot i yeah, remember just, that one yeah un- like maybe i'm getting older i'm like it was never this violent uh, or or the thanksgiving treehouse of horror they did yeah. that starts with the uh the parody of the mel gibson aztec film apocalypto apocalypto that is brutal as hell which i mean at least makes it like accurate to apocalypto i suppose but uh but yeah the i can't remember which one this was but uh when i was going through all the treehouses there's one where crusty is put through a wood chipper and that scene is so graphic and violent <laughs> like it, it kind of had the same reaction that um an adult in the simpsons universe might have watching an itchy scratchy episode <laughs> I, I felt old when i saw that mm-hmm. uh, this is too much this I, is a little excessive i guess you know we did see the virus that turns you inside out you know that that didn't seem too much when we were kids no or at least to me people More cartoony said, yeah i mean i was uh geez i was like a 12 when i saw that and i thought it was funny but i see people on twitter saying i was scarred by that <laughs> when i see uh later treehouses of horror again with all the violence but in that one it's like they're happy to be inside out they're singing a song about it that's true yeah i uh so i i did google what you should do if you cut off a finger and so i'm going to quote from uh, the web md on this the finger should be kept moist but not wet or submerged in water saline is ideal but a moist clean paper towel is the best most people will have around this should be wrapped around in a clean zip sealing bag or sterile container and placed in ice the amputated finger should not directly contact the ice though and dry ice should not be used as this will permanently damage the tissue of the severed finger so there you go they they follow the rules slightly though homer's thumb is put directly onto ice which Mm. they shouldn't be doing and i'll though you know what now hearing that thing about saline the uh the pickling jar not as dumb as you think hmm, interesting yeah yeah though obviously webmd doesn't say put it in pickle brine they do not say that the healing power of garlic and dill and also on the reattaching thing it does say that in some cases if you have you know your regular fingers like pinky and ring they say eh, you know you maybe don't want to reattach it because the ligaments won't get all back together and it'll actually be harder for you to move your hand from then on with a reattached like one of those but they say opposite for thumb if you can if you can try to reattach a thumb you do it like mm-hmm. give it a shot that's yeah. that's their opinion i mean i remember in college uh one of my professors my logic professor because i took a logic class <laughs> uh, it was necessary to be such a good podcaster all of the fingers were missing on one hand oh wow and i thought to myself there's got to be a story there mm. and uh i don't know it's none of my business but I, I feel like if i was in the same position i would just tell the story on the first day like <laughs> you're gonna be looking at my hands yeah, yeah. here's what happens <laughs> You know, uh, if I had to lose a finger, it would be my ring finger. Oh, no. It's so useless. Look at this thing. It doesn't do anything. That's your proof of marriage. I don't need this. I don't don't even uh, use it when I draw. Actually, no, wait, I do. Shoot. Forget what I said. Okay, Okay, you'll you'll have to to wear the wedding bracelet then. 
<laughs> I, I remember in the video game Heavy Rain, there's a challenge cool. of like, well, you cut off your pinky or not to prove you love your son. And uh, that's the future of video oh, games right. right there. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and I did it in the game because I was like, ah, pinky, left hand pinky. I can live without that, you know. And of course, I'd, I'd look like a cool Yakuza or I'd <laughs> buy I just buy one of those gloves like the guys in the Yakuza video games have to cover their uh, their missing pinky. But how will you make promises without your pinky finger? <laughs> that's very important in uh, that there is a very corny pinky promise scene in the many saints of newark i won't spoil <laughs> for people but i was just thinking of pinky promises uh but yes anyway now not only uh is homer bleeding but they're on the run from the law uh it's they call it uh they they then head out uh homer has to chase after sans little helper which i really love the animation like it's a dog that thinks he's playing a game of keep keep away mm-hmm. i really like that <laughs> Uh, and as Homer chases him, he goes into the house and we get a, I've said before, I don't like jokes about Ned being a Christian extremist who uh, (laughs) says Harry Potter would go to hell. But as far as accuracy goes, as somebody who worked in a movie theater in in Florida when Harry Potter movies were coming out, I met several people who said, do not give me your Harry Potter bag. That is witchcraft. Like, I don't want a bag of Harry Potter popcorn. Like, and I worked with somebody else at a blockbuster video who said like, well, you like those Harry Potter movies? You know, it's the devil. Like I had to, these were realistic things back then. Mm -hmm. It may seems silly that ned would say this but actually pretty real in in the united states and it was uh very savvy of them because uh harry potter was not a uh movie yet it would be yeah. a movie that fall so people were talking a lot about the books uh, at this point in time the fourth book was out in uh in america mm. so uh 2000 is when that book came out. i think the next one was 2003 i didn't read them you know what <laughs> i came out on top you were right bob because yeah, knowing was... all that shit yeah. nobody needs to know it anymore yeah i never read it either i i saw like a couple of films but it's it's just not for me i regret every hour i invested in it i feel really bad for all of the uh lgbtq people i know who uh liked it so much that they even got tattoos of it and have now had to like get the tattoo covered up or removed because they're just like ah fuck that lady i guess now we're we're on rod and todd's side with yeah the cheering <laughs> yes of- <laughs> the book being incinerated uh, not yeah. for the, the same reasons but still i uh yeah and also uh, the simpsons would have their own harry potter parody character they would use several times uh, angelica button which would debut in the episode the ha ha couple in 2006 all ah, right uh there was an episode in which homer was reading the uh series to lisa and he read ahead and found out that version of dumbledore dies right and he has right. to figure out like should i actually read lisa the story or make up a new ending or something like that that's a clever it's, idea. It's always weird when The Simpsons has both the parody thing and the real thing in the world. Kind of like how they have Star Wars and Cosmic Wars. Yes. yes. I yeah. don't like that. Oh, well, they love playing, uh, sorry, paying tribute to Star Wars as a Disney brand. And now they do. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> in just three episodes forward, we've got the Treehouse of Horror for season 13, which has the Harry Potter one in it. So, uh, but uh, yeah, so Homer, not only does he run through Ned's house, but also he uh, destroys the train the little toy train that's about to run over his thumb which uh that's fun posing on that and just the i just love the timing of how homer just crush like hit foot just in there crushing that little lionel train and destroying todd flander or rod's uh life really we don't need to comment on every line of dialogue but i do want to comment on what the dilly didlio mm. i think it is the first or sorry the third parody of what the dealio in this uh in this show and that was a f- super short-lived catchphrase mm. in this time area uh time uh, zone or whatever that we're in right now uh, <laughs> the late 90s early 2000s and i like it wasn't invented by buster rhymes but it was in that song uh, put your hands where my eyes could see mm. and i think that's what popularized it but people were saying what the dealio for about four years you had uh, to be there i think my mom even said it wow yeah and I- it's perfectly right for it to be uh flanderized mm-hmm. oh yeah i do miss uh all right i prefer the way marge says what the dealio that's that's a good one uh but homer gets back his thumb i i do feel bad too for how santa's little helper is crushed and homer jumping on him but he seems fine after so at least homer didn't like injure him (laughs) and so yes they put it on ice but directly on ice listeners if this if this happens to you in a bag around a moist paper towel not directly touching the ice okay and then homer as he's trying to make up a lie they smash right into the car causing a car accident which uh yeah there's car accidents that are very important in the story of go as well 
well. Yeah, and uh, I want to know what Marge's original line was because let's just say Bart did it is a uh, you know totally ADR line. Yeah, there's yeah. there's an even more criminal ADR mouth wronging in this episode, but that's up there. In in Go, they're basically given a Ferrari because they're on the run out of this casino because something happened. No spoilers here, but uh, Tay Diggs is a character in the movie. He's very well dressed compared to his dirtbag friends, and the uh, racist guy with the Ferrari thinks he's a valet, mm-hmm. so he just hands him the keys, and that's how they get a Ferrari. Yeah, uh, it's cool, man. I I uh, I forgot how cool that movie was, uh, especially the Vegas thing. Just made me want to be back in Vegas, baby, uh, and and eating a, but not eating any shrimp. That film taught no. me don't eat shrimp in Vegas. I had food poisoning uh, very badly uh, recently, and that's one oh, part no. of the movie I didn't like seeing. <laughs> <laughs> I was feverish and hallucinating. You were and just like Breckin Meyer. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, Nina took care when, of me. When Rainier Wolf Castle smashes Marge's car with a golf club, I was wondering if that's a reference mm-hmm. to Jack Nicholson doing the same thing. I'm 94. pretty sure it is. Yes. yes. Yeah. His 1994 road rage incident. I like how he's not even paying attention to Marge or Homer. He just is going off on the car with the golf ah, club. That's road rage for you, Nowadays, man. Um, there would be video footage of that. I'm sad we didn't get it. Yeah. The, the instant. Yeah. yeah. Or a picture or something. <laughs> it also, I remember that being so funny at the time because I already, because of jokes on The Simpsons, I already conflated Jack Nicholas, the golfer, with Jack Nicholson, the actor. And so, <laughs> and then there is a story of guy smashing a car with a golf club, but it's Nicholson. It added to my confusion. He should have said, look at me, I'm Jack Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been funny. Uh, but yeah, that's what happened there. Yeah. And apparently he paid the guy $500,000. That's like, good. So, he had yeah. it. That's like 1% of his Batman money, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, though, you know, the guy whose car he smashed, it was a Mercedes Benz, mm. which means the dude who he who he pissed off was a fellow rich guy who could actually like threaten to sue him. Not not some nobody like Marge and Homer mm-hmm. in this case, uh, which uh, man, how they fix their car after this? I'm, I'm going to say they spent some of that diamond money on, on fixing their car. I think so. That's yeah. where it all went. Yeah. <laughs> and paying back Ramier for stealing his car and paying the the mob doctor yes yeah <laughs> But uh, yes, so they steal the car and this is when uh, they visit Dr. Hibbert, which even at this point, Marge has to say, Hibbert's gotten really bad. Yeah. I'm sorry, Homer. Your HMO doesn't cover this type of injury. But I have finger insurance. A thumb is not a finger. Isn't there anything you can do? Well, I could cut off the other thumb for a sense of symmetry. Symmetry, eh? Hibbert's really losing it. We're going to doctor next. We need more rights. My thumb is fading fast! <laughs> Quick, Mo! March, cut off my thumb! No problem. Just stick the old eye gouger in the pickle brine. That'll keep your thumb fresh and delicious. Thanks, Mo. Hey, uh, hey, ain't you gonna have a beer? Well, I really shouldn't. What with my massive blood loss and all. <laughs> Although I do like the occasional beer. <laughs> Did you ever see that blue man group? Total ripoff of the Smurfs. And the Smurfs. They suck! Uh Uh-oh, I smell gangrene. We gotta wake him up. A little (laughs) coffee will do the trick. I wish they drew him as sober Barney when he said that. Yeah, he's still coffee Barney. And it's one mess up in this, yeah. I will say in in Japanese, finger is yubi and thumb is oya yubi. And that means parent finger. (laughs) I like that. In Japanese, a thumb is technically a finger. Oh, Uh, that's right. That's why Oyakodon is called that, right? Thumb is their leader. Yeah. Okay. I like the uh, the totally realistic appearance of a coffee pot at a bar, which always happens because, uh, you know, it's there for the bartenders who are working and dealing with awful people. They need to be alert. <laughs> but also people who get too drunk to drive home, they think if I have one cup of coffee, that'll get me sober enough to, you know, maybe not drive through a preschool. The, the way Barney pours it into Homer's mouth, though, that looks very painful. Yeah, I yeah. think that's unless what, it's very cold. I think that's what. No, your steam coming off it. I, I think that's what wakes Homer up is the pain of half a pot of coffee poured directly into your mouth. That skull, like Homer, shouldn't be able to talk for the rest of the episode. Really, his, his esophagus is probably scorched too. Hmm. Also, I like how the other acts reveal that Homer gets that drunk in like literally ten seconds. Mm-hmm. Like it looks like a time cut in Act One, but then you see that like. 
Lisa, it's 30 seconds tops in, in the time it takes for Homer to drink that beer and then Marge go like, ah, he's on the Blue Man group again and drive away. And they were at That's the height of... from all the blood loss. Mm-hmm. That too, yeah. Alcohol on top of blood loss, not good. <laughs> really and, not good. And a Blue Man group, uh, hotter than ever in 2001. Yeah, I, uh, I've i seen I've seen uh, that Blue Man group. I, I assumed you did for some reason and I don't know why. Uh, you know, the family went to Vegas. It's easy tickets to get. And it's totally good. Mm-hmm. It's fine, you know. I don't uh, understand that. What do they even do? It's Play it, music? Yeah, Dance? It's like performance art. It's basically like a, a very... What's the word of It's a more mainstream version of like a performance art piece. It's like three guys all playing in blue and then they're like, oh, we're all enrolling toilet paper and then doing like a dance about it. Oh, and I turn the toilet pe- paper into a drum uh, a baton. Boom, 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 boom. boom. It's what for uh, white people who are too afraid to w- go see Stomp. Sure, yes. It is. <laughs> I remember uh, Stomp, yeah. It's like, oh, well, if the Stomp people were blue, then I'm not as worried. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Uh, I've seen them in Vegas. I have not seen the Jabberwockies, which are supposed to be the mm. even weirder version of uh, the, the mask guys. Yes. They creep me out. I don't like them. But if you're looking for $60 as a way to have fun in Las Vegas, you know, my first vote would have been go to the Evil Dead musical, but unfortunately that's now closed. No, no longer doing the Evil Dead musical, which uh, was a good time. I did see that too. But, uh, but yeah, we're, home- still in pan- uh, we're still in a pandemic as we're recording this, and uh, there's all sorts of supply issues all around the world and i saw an article recently saying there was this paint maker a dutch paint maker who's running out of the color blue mm-hmm. or a certain shade of blue or something whatever you use to make the color blue uh, there's a s- supply chain issue with that oh no the blue mans are in trouble they've been, they've they, been a stockpile they've been renamed the man group <laughs> Uh, also you know what those pickled eggs first appeared in some enchanted evening and they're paying off plot wise Mm -hmm. homer runs off he sees that marge has abandoned him which does look pretty bad but in marge's defense homer got drunk instead of getting treatment for his thumb so i think she you know i can understand why she's like "Eh, all right i'm out of here like homer homer's getting drunk i'll just take lisa home but well well that and uh she's like oh he's on the blue man group again this is like a while she's heard this rant before yeah yeah. But I guess when you see Homer just head outside the door and Marge isn't there, you do think pretty poorly of Marge in that moment. <laughs> I will say um, I agree with Homer. I think the Smurfs suck. I've never liked them. Absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. Henry and I were born into a world of Smurfs dominance and I never liked them. My sister did. Maybe that's why. But they were all just, I mean, they're the happy little elves, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the Smurfs can be so consistently popular. Homer can still complain about the Smurfs in 2001, just as much as the show complained about the Smurfs in 1989. Will you guys ever do what a cartoon on the Smurfs? Uh, I think we have to. Yeah. It's such a big thing. I, I, I definitely many times when we've covered people who worked in the, uh, the animation world in the 80s i just have to go like and they worked at the smurfs factory obviously <laughs> and then we'll have to, uh, you'll have to watch the live action film with hank azaria i don't think i'll be doing that we talked about how his <laughs> uh his his portrayal of gargamel now i think is uh accidentally anti-semitic or something I th- yes <laughs> it's like uh he looks like a like a caricature in like a racist magazine <laughs> now and he's saying he can finally steal all those smurfs to turn yeah. them into gold but uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> is that what he does uh that was one of his plans yeah that uh, smurfs if, if i can get into smurfs lore here gargamel wants to seal smurfs or smurf berries uh because he can use them in a uh, concoction that transforms like liquid into gold it's uh he's he's a bit of an alchemist to old gargamel is. Uh, okay i thought you just like would squeeze a smurf to death and, <laughs> and stuff would come out that would turn into gold he, he gargamel wants to put him in his cauldron definitely and turn them into gold that's if, his plan if any of us now now i want to steal some smurfs <laughs> if any some gold if any of us us mentioned gargamel at that table read he would have choke slammed us yes yeah uh, it's like oh man i like you know you chalmers and gargamel my two favorite characters and you've done them both you, you could have mentioned say. herman's head but not this yes, yeah. do you think he'd be more insulted by herman heads and gargamel i don't know no you know what uh, on herman's head he had the point of view at least i'm not one of the people in the head that's true and he, he was correct about that <laughs> but yes homer tries hitchhiking doesn't work so well without a thumb uh he does get in the car with cletus though cletus pulls up in i can't 
can't tell what country song it is. Can you tell, Bob? Henry, one guess at which band is playing the song. God damn it. It's, yes. It, really? It's NRBQ again? It is. And ah. it's so buried in the mix that it's not listed on the wiki that lists the appearances of NRBQ songs. I there thought so. There are eight appearances listed. This is the secret ninth appearance. It's the song Keep Looking for Tumbleweeds Danny from their first kids album, which uh, there was a song from that on the Homer Becomes the Baby Safety Guy. Yes. Yeah. The, the Safety First. Yeah. Yes. That is the secret ninth NRBQ song in Mike Scully's run. There's one more coming up in Hunk a Hunk of Burns and Love. Stay tuned. I saw someone on your Patreon who are, who's uh, sick of all your NRBQ bashing. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I like what you say. I like their uh, song about Diamond Lou Albano. Yeah, it's a fun song. And I like the joke song they make about... Oh, sorry, fa- Captain Lou. He was not Diamond Lou. Yes, yeah. You're thinking of getting him confused with Diamond... Uh, Dallas uh, Page? Yeah, I think that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I like their uh, Lou Albano song. I also... I like the joke song they make up for uh, like a father and son in love. That mm-hmm. uh, from the, the the motorbike episode. A mayonnaise and marmalade. Yes, yeah. I don't even know what the hell this band was until... Uh, I learned about it through uh, Toggy Simpsons. And now, like, every time they come up, I'm like, man, they do use them a lot in the show. <laughs> Mike Scully. Well, Scully does, right? Oh, Scully. Yeah. The, I mean, Scully, if he wasn't getting a kickback from the NRBQ guys, he, he deserved one. Because he, he, I think he must have made them at least $5 million <laughs> on just, just through constant replaying of it. Disney yeah. sending I mean, this, them checks. This seems like a... It seems like a good song pick for this scene, though. No, it doesn't stand out as like, oh, this is a bad song or whatever. I should have realized if it wasn't a song I recognized and it sounded like it was sung by white guys in their 50s, I should have realized it was NRBQ. I should have. I want to say uh, Homer attempting to hitchhike without a thumb is one of the best jokes they've had in a long time. (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't work. (laughs) Why isn't this working? I love it. Yeah. (laughs) Though uh, Cletus is really good at growing fingers back because he, for one joke, he he has only a middle finger and a thumb, but then in the very next scene, all fingers are back on his left hand. Cletus is living in Gattaca world. He is. He's, uh, I, I would guess something in his inbreeding gave him the ability to regrow fingers. That's what I'm going to say. I, I love the book, uh, The Grapes of Wrath. Uh, yes, sorry. I almost said the Simpsons title. Uh, uh, one of the more shocking things is just in the beginning where they just come and they, they just like matter of fact say, oh yeah, this pig ate, this pig ate a baby. And that's what happened to this baby. Oh, wow. So uh, watch out for pigs. <laughs> oh yeah, pigs will absolutely eat people. They're scary. It's uh, I, uh, Homer is right to be scared of that, uh, of, the, <laughs> of, of the mascot of uh, Springfield A&M. When that, that, that bite, he could have easily lost a finger. Sorry, Oinks a lot yeah. could have done a Cletus on him. Yeah. Most recently, like in 2019, a woman in Russia had a seizure while feeding her hogs and she was eaten alive. Oh, mm. man. That's Jeez. all it takes. You just like stumble, fall in a pit of hogs and they'll eat you. You know what? I laughed at that feral hogs lady, but now I need to buy a gun. They're I keeping us a safe. Machine gun. Yeah. <laughs> they head over to Dr. Nick's. La- First time oh, we've seen Dr. Nick in a while, too. The- oh, sorry. Yes, Nina? They- there was a deleted scene from this part. Which oh. apparently was used in an ad. Like I saw on uh, Simpsons Archive uh, for this episode, they were like, oh, there was a scene here where uh, Homer spots a, a tick on Cletus and it wasn't shown in the episode. Hmm. So I yes. guess sometimes they had deleted scenes in the promos. Uh, so actually the two, yes, there are two deleted scenes that are on the DVD. I, I know the one you're talking about. Though this one actually appears in the, it does appear in this sequence, but in the second act replay of it, because it's it's after Homer's abracathumbra, uh, after uh, Cletus laughs and says he should be one of those magic queers, uh, then Homer says like, oh really? Let me try a different trick. And he's going to like do the find a quarter behind your ear trick. <laughs> But then he sees there's a tick behind Cletus's ear, and Cletus goes like, "No, no, that's uh, that's my friend. I, I'm keeping this tick." And uh, then later, there's another deleted scene all, uh, that calls it back. That I can see why they cut it as well. You said the joke, but I laughed really loud at Cletus calling Homer one of them TV magic queers. Which yeah. it feels like Dana Gould wrote that joke for some reason. And I don't it, know why. It kind of does. It feels like it? what yeah. his dad called like David Copperfield or yeah, something yes, like that. Yes. But yes, Dr. Nick returns as well a while since we've seen him. And uh, he has quite a uh, Yakov Smirnoff delivery here. <laughs> Inflammable means flammable? What a country. Can you drive me to Shelbyville Hospital? I reckon so. <laughs> hey, somebody done stoned in my wheels. Thanks a lot. Now I gotta walk to Shelbyville. <laughs> it's too late. Old friend, 
We always knew this day would come. Say goodbye to your brother. What the hell? <gasps> Linguo! Dead! Linguo... is... <laughs> dead! <sighs> Something about how Dan delivers Linguo! Dead? Like, yeah. I just love that delivery so much. You can hear the colon in there. And that he cares so much about this when he's about to throw his thumb away in the garbage. Like, that he's like, he's instead of, he's now concerned about a robot he met for like five seconds and destroyed. Now he's like treating it like a, more, with more gravitas than if he <laughs> saw like uh, a dead pet of his. And with uh, Dr. Nick's uh, What a Country joke, Mike Scully has come full circle because his first writing job was on the Yakov Smirnov sitcom what a country mm -hmm. so for one of his last simpsons episodes he show runs he works that uh punchline in so Great. he's coming full circle <laughs> i think i learned from this episode that flammable and inflammable are the same thing i did too why is it like that me too uh, and it seems wrong the english language it, it is silly does seem wrong yeah. yeah no inflammable should mean it's like invincible it's the invincible version of flam of flammable it means oh it's not you can't light on fire yeah i was shocked to learn i remember seeing this first time uh, with my mom and she was like no really that's true inflammable also means flammable and it's I, a very important word mm -hmm. that you would think it'd be very clear <laughs> it's uh, it causes explosions as happens to dr nick like yeah I, you know homer should have asked now i think about it when homer goes to moe's mo already did his surgery on his brain crayon right he, he should have uh, or crayon uh he will not say crayon around me <laughs> that's right i'm a doctor <laughs> uh, he should have just uh reattached the thumb himself to homer you know mm -hmm. maybe he only specializes in the head area uh maybe yeah <laughs> It's a good thing Lingo wasn't around Cletus because it would have exploded a lot sooner. Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, man. And yeah, definitely on my first viewing, Homer's somber closing of Lingo's eyes, I was just, I think uh, my reaction was, well, this doesn't make sense. But that's most Simpsons episodes now don't make sense. So uh, this won't be explained. That's why it was such a treat that it would be explained later. I like that. That, that kind of reminds me of the Big City Greens episode we just covered. Yeah, where he closes Barry, uh, Barry Cuda's eye <laughs> after he dies. Barry Cuda, uh, the singing fish robot. There's there's something just innately funny about the somber closing of the eyes of an inanimate object. It's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> then we start with Lisa's day. Same jokes as before. Son of a diddly in the newspaper. Uh, then, just as Lisa had said in the Homer episode of, of the crayon we just mentioned, uh, Lisa is using Tai Chi to help her, just mm -hmm. as she said. The no chai tea is visible in this scene. I'm sure people still do it. I associate tai chi with like a uh, like kind of a yuppie-ish kind of thing. Mm. You'd see jokes about it on TV. Uh, when I go to the uh, airport, the San Francisco airport in the international terminal, there's this little area where you can you know get coffee and there's like an outside area people hang out. I always see people doing tai chi out there. Oh wow! Like before yeah. their flight or something. <laughs> I can see it be um, relaxing. If you go on a morning walk around here, you'll always see like a huge group of like old Asian ladies doing tai chi out in the park you know i uh, i was seeing it of the the yuppie version of it around berkeley during uh, the early uh, like first eight months of the pandemic uh in, in a parking lot near where i live on my morning walk uh at about eight every morning or five on the weekdays at eight there would be a lineup of of people they'd have rolled out their mats in the parking lot like all right open air tai chi we're gonna well do it here now uh i've and never done it myself but i'm sure it's a lot harder than it looks mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. moving that slowly can be um like a strain on your muscles like holding a position it's like yoga but moving <laughs> you know donnie yen in those ip man movies makes it look pretty badass too so i i want to learn but yes yeah, so marge screeches breakfast once more and this is when you as a viewer know this is a repeating thing mm -hmm. yeah we then get to see a briefer version of bart hearing millhouse at the door and then all over again we get to see the pain on marge's face that no one wants to eat her crummy breakfast <laughs> then we follow lisa upstairs instead of seeing homer uh cut his thumb off hang on linguo you'll be up and conjugating in no time Quiet, please. Some of us are trying to weld. <laughs> Almost done. Just lay still. Lie still. I knew that. Just testing. Sentence fragment. Sentence fragment is also a sentence fragment. 
must conserve battery power. Just come on. Uh-oh, the bus! Hey, stop! Wait! Oh, any day but science project day. Kiss first place goodbye, Lisa. <laughs> Somebody took my bike! Ugh! Mom, I need a ride to school! We gotta get to the hospital, Homer! Aww. This is when Lisa must run and just as Lola runs. That sequence of her, uh, when she says, quiet please, some of us are trying to weld, every mouth movement is wrong mm -hmm. on it. And I really want to know what the original line was. But it's very audible that Homer says, ah, my thumb, and Lisa does not care. Like, that doesn't make her pause even a little bit. Lisa, I'm sure he hurts himself all the time at home. Yeah, she has seen makes worse. a big deal out of it. Yeah. Lisa created a robot more pedantic than she is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I, I try to use proper grammar when I speak, but it, it drives me nuts how I can never figure out lay versus lie unless I look it up. Mm -hmm. So you, li you lie down, but you lay something down. That's how it works, right? Yes, I guess so. But ultimately, it doesn't matter because if language is that complicated, people will just accept whatever you say. I tr I trust your opinion on this, Nina. But yeah, I don't. I I, I only know when my grammar is wrong when red lines sh appear beneath text <laughs> on something, and I know I'm wrong. <laughs> and by the way, the I'm glad I'm less pedantic these days. Yes, I I have a master's in English, and I will not tolerate prescriptivism in my house. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, the Run Lola Run song is called Running One. Mm. In case you're wondering where, where that is, if you want to look it up. It's they paid the, for the real song, yeah, man. Yeah. That's cool. I like that. And also, I love the shot of Martin uh, with his, you know, electric, uh, his lightning ball, I guess you'd call it. Uh, that, and, and the way he says, kiss first place goodbye. Uh, it, ha it does remind me of his pride in his geode. <laughs> uh, but I noticed a mistake. Millhouse is on the bus. Oh, you can spot Millhouse behind Martin when he's saying "kiss first place goodbye." That's, Lisa, that's the Estonian little person. He only plays Millhouse when he gets hurt. <laughs> uh, he's still pretending <laughs> to be Millhouse to this day. Yes. Okay. All right. I saw uh, I saw someone post a screenshot of that and call it uh, "Dear Evan Hansen." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. At uh, oh man, I if you're listening to this six months after it goes live, you won't know what "Dear Evan Hansen" is, but it was. <laughs> With the toast of the uh, town. Watch, watch the Jenny Nicholson video about it. If it hasn't yeah. been taken down by the Dear Evan Hansen company by then, because they're disputing it. Oh, that's both that video. I watched that. That's where I learned the extra hateable fact about that movie. That like, oh, the guy who is completely miscast in the role, his dad's a producer on it. That's why mm. it like that makes him. It makes it even. Uh, I I pity him even less when people make fun of his performance in it. But yes, this is this would be the moment when Lisa would get on the short bus. Fortunately, she does not. In, in this version. I never understood like what uh, Martin's thing is. Like I know what he's carrying, but did he make that himself? Is that what he's going to present? I, I assume he did make it himself. Yeah. Otherwise... I guess that's pretty impressive. It's not one he bought at Spencer's Gifts. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you could build one of those yourselves, then that's impressive. And like in Run, Lola, Run, uh, Lisa is almost hit by a car. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. I think in some of the timeline she is hit. That's correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. She bounces off that Mr. Martin dude's car and then... And also also, you know, they do copy not just the new music and the shots of the running, but also the big, they even imitate the like big overhead shot of her running through the town square kind of thing. So, you know, for about a minute here, it's it's run, Lola, run. But otherwise, no, it's it's not. <laughs> this, this is definitely the, the most recognizable reference to run, Lola, run, Orgo, which, which is probably why people mistakenly think this entire episode is based on run, Lola, run. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, because it's so in your face. And also, I would think most people remember, more people remember Run, Lola, Run than Go, I'm going to say, yeah. these days. I, I would bet. Oh, completely, yeah. <laughs> I, I do like Run, Lola, Run more, but they're both um, equally worth watching, I'd say. And they fly right by, like, short, mm -hmm. they, they were, the, like, some of the shortest 90 minutes I've spent watching a movie. When everything else is, like, uh, the, I felt that same way watching Venom. And then, meanwhile, we got Dune coming out this week that's, like, three hours long. It's it's <laughs> It comes into my home on HBO Max, and I'm not watching it. <laughs> the Eternals is, like, two hours and 40 minutes long. What are we doing? I want to see it. I want to see uh, the new Dune. I heard it only covers half of the first book, though. I have heard that, yeah, though. I've never, Dune is one of those things, I was like, boy, I'm, I'm a failure as a nerd that I've never read at Dune, but I've not. I you you would think all the other things I've I've experienced, I've not experienced to Dune, unfortunately. There's no such thing as being a failure of a nerd. Uh, if you're a nerd, you've already failed. Yeah, exactly. It's over for I'm you. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding, folks. 
Uh, but yeah, Krusty, Krusty famously runs over people many times, as we know. Glug, glug, yeah. vroom, vroom, thump, thump. <laughs> that must be why Teeny is his driver now, I mm-hmm. guess. But also, yeah, you know, after Day of the Jacket Apes, I think they fell back in love with Mr. Teeny. You know, they hadn't done much with Mr. Teeny in a little while. And this now, season 12, they're like, hey, it's funny to have this little chimp do stuff. Because monkey jokes were kind of overused back then. And I guess they were trying to bring it back a little bit here. Mm-hmm. God, I mean, yeah, the, the pointing monkey and chris uh in 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 the family guy closet thing oh like, right yeah. yep. i uh, forgot about that recurring joke yeah a real yeah, i mean you know well speaking of like not trusting hogs i would not trust a chimp ever either <laughs> that's acting uh, i i feel for all the actors who acted with real uh, gorillas or chimps or uh, or or orangutans it all seems very dangerous oh man i would i would never but you know what like so it's been canceled now unfortunately but why the last man the live action series finally came out and there's a, a monkey in that like in the original story and the monkey in the show is entirely cg because uh disney has a, a no primates policy for their shows oh wow no real life primates so ampersand i i haven't watched the show yet ampersand's uh he's he's all cg wow yeah but it, it's really well done okay it's not distractingly bad cg or anything like that like i, I think this is a better way to go instead of using real live chimps or monkeys. I always figured that ampersand role was written for the one capuchin monkey that's in everything, who is in Outbreak <laughs> and Friends, <laughs> and also the Ken Jong Doctor show. Even like 15 years later, it was the same uh, monkey playing the role, being used in that show as in Friends and Outbreak in the 90s. Well, no, Disney doesn't allow it. Uh, you know what? I, I guess that is the better thing, honestly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> also, when I watched Go last night, I was like, oh, there's a joke about subtitling an animal in this movie, too, just like with mm. Mr. Teeny in this episode. That's right. Yeah. Uh, first off, I like that Krusty, the only reason he doesn't care that they almost ran over Lisa is that she is a viewer in his key demographic. <laughs> That's, That's the, the only, only reason. reason why Krusty would do a favor. <laughs> yes. But Mr. Teeny being asked for directions and just saying back in subtitles, like, I don't know what you're saying. That gave me, I. that was a really great joke. <laughs> I like that. Uh, and then Wiggum is just like, ah, what? That's uh, okay. Hey, we got the same hat. Like, Wiggum also had a new level of stupidity in this episode, too. Well, <laughs> oh, he doesn't care when he sees a, a dog driving a bus or whatever that was. Yeah. And he, he uses a chauffeur with a uh, cop. <laughs> that, yes. And so Lisa gets dropped off. And when she gets there, so Nina, you're the only one of us who is, uh, well, actually, no, Bob, you were taught French in school. I took Spanish. But, yes. Uh, against my will, I was taught French. <laughs> I was in French immersion. Oh man, that's that's far I'm better the most than what Americans. In do. French. Uh, did this did this bring back any memories for you? And uh, when they taught you how to laugh like a Frenchman as well, uh, <laughs> I just rec- I recognized all the words just from knowing French, yeah. knowing yeah. some French. Lenina knows the more frog, than me. The frog eats the grapefruit. Yeah. I, I knew grapefruit because pumplemousse is like a comedy French word mm-hmm. to American ears. Yes, I've I've heard it quite it is funny. <laughs> So it's uh, new, I guess. Uh, I noticed like the calendar on the wall says Juillet, which is July, even though it's supposed to be March. Hey, hmm. wait a minute. That's the uh, this West Springfield school isn't as good as I thought it was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Things will be different at the magnet school. Uh, also, the French. I was trying to see if they reuse the character art, and it's the the French teacher is similar to the guy who makes the deadly eclair and the French accordion man on the Honey Bunch, but not a reused character hmm. model. So. There's like three of these very caricatured frenchmen now <laughs> frenchmen are skinny they have pencil mustaches and they're rude big that, noses too i guess oh yes pointed noses yes uh but yes when lisa lisa is shocked Sorry, i just to- thought of a mean joke <laughs> oh. <laughs> what to say oh so it's bob with a mustache thank you oh ouch man <laughs> thank you that's some of that merry that married humor right there <laughs> trading barbs <laughs> Uh, but uh, eh, no, Nina. <laughs> uh, but yes, uh, Lisa realizes she's in the wrong school, but she makes a new friend. What? La grenouille mange les pamplemousses. La grenouille mange la pamplemousse. Huh? This isn't Miss Hoover's class. I do not know this, Mademoiselle Hoover, of which you speak. <laughs> What's happening? Where am I? Sacre bleu. What a foolish question! You are at West Springfield Elementary School! West Springfield? I'm at the wrong school! <laughs> en français! <laughs> oh, sorry, I was rushing because I'm in the wrong school. <laughs> Can you believe that? It's understandable. 
All the schools in this area were built from identical plants. I guess they didn't have enough money to hire I am Pei. <laughs> oh, you know about I am Pei? I am impressed. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Thelonious. As in monk? Yes, the esoteric appeal is worth the beatings. What do your friends call you? I don't really have any friends. <gasps> Just like me. <laughs> And yes, uh, it's the Simpsons debut of Frankie Muniz, mm-hmm. uh, the star, the titular Malcolm in the middle. Mm-hmm. And we did an entire episode of Talking Simpsons about Malcolm in the middle, uh, I think last year in 2020. Yes. Yeah. And uh, it's a, a great show, just a very good show on the level of the Simpsons. And it was the next show on that night. Holds on up Fox. great. Yeah. Yeah. You guys were both watching it at the time, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, Definitely. Yeah. yeah, I was reared to the very end. I've still never seen it. It's really? good. Oh, you gotta. You got. I, I remember it being advertised as like oh it's like live action simpsons i never bought it though i it's it, i think it's that's a it's an apt comparison apt. yes it's <laughs> like the simpsons except they never forgot the family is poor yeah yeah mm-hmm. and also they unfortunately are cursed with aging unlike the simpsons yes so oh uh, okay so frankie muniz yeah we know his politics are bad but yeah, pro yeah. follow on twitter because he is the biggest sad sack and he really leans into it Aww. he is uh, a very sad dad and he lives a very pedestrian life again but he leans into it like i'm looking at some of his tweets now and one of them is basically, boy, I love, I sure do love Riceroni at Riceroni. <laughs> And um, wow. Frankie Muniz also says, not only was eating at White Castle painful while I was doing it, the White Castle farts and burps I've had for the past 24 hours since reminds me to never do that again. Page may kill me. Page might kill me. No, I might kill me. Jesus. Man, and man. lots of things about how his wife won't let him do things or how <laughs> like his wife slipped on oatmeal and blamed him, but he doesn't eat oatmeal. And uh, yeah, lots man, of... lots of life for old Muniz. I mean, he's had a lot of uh, serious brain issues. So, no, you know, like, that'll put you in a space. Yeah, he he, if he doesn't, as he says, said, he does not remember anything about making Malcolm in the Middle. I would guess he also doesn't remember recording this guest appearance on The Simpsons either. Probably not. Uh, yeah. Here's another one. Was supposed to get ice cream with my wife tonight, but she fell asleep a few hours ago. So now I'm getting ice cream with myself because I'm pretty fat. <laughs> Damn. Jeez. Dark life. Dark life for old Frankie. Man. Uh, here's an interesting thing, too, about having him on, though, that Malcolm in the Middle, I, I looked up like, oh, what was the episode that aired with this? It was a rerun. But two weeks before before alongside simpson safari malcolm in the middle did their sliding doors parody episode that's also about like timeline retelling of scenes things the bowling episode you know what i watched that one for our podcast last year it's even more complex than this yes yeah it's really good have you seen sliding doors I have yes, not. Yes, yeah. I okay, have. Th- that's that's one I do want to watch because of the the two different stories thing. So, Bob, we should put that on our list. Mm. I smell a date night <laughs> being planned here. <laughs> now, the the bowling episode is is really great. I think actually, probably I watched that live and seeing it two weeks before this one, it maybe made me think that this episode wasn't as clever as it is because I was like, ah, I just saw that bowling episode mm. and that was pretty intricate too. Oh, another tweet. Sorry, uh, one one positive <laughs> tweet from my Frankie Muniz. Uh, my armpits stink, but that's okay because I love my wife and I love my life. <laughs> hey, all right, that's nice. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just uh, follow him, and uh, I hope he hope he's doing better these days. The Here? French teacher pronouncing Hoover's name like that reminded me like I I like to uh, say people's names in a uh, <laughs> the way it would be read in French sometimes for fun. And Henry, yours is the most fun. Henri Gilbert. That does sound Sounds much more so fun. so sophisticated. I do like that. Yeah, Henri Gilbert. Like Gilbert. Bob and mine are, are boring. Yeah, <laughs> Bob. Also, I much, I much prefer the Uver to how, like, Brits say hover. They say they 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 call a Hoover vacuum a hover vacuum. That's oh really? Like, yeah. Mm. I I learned that because there was a video game called Hover Bover, which was uh, we would always make fun of in the office as like the most British video game we've ever heard of, Hover Bover, <laughs> which means a uh, Hoover bother, I suppose. Mm. Yeah. Oh yeah, Nina. Because of the French uh, having poisoned your brain, well, uh, what do you call our president? <laughs> <laughs> Je be den. Be den. No, I say I say. Biden in my head because it would be Biden in if you read B I D E N uh, through French eyes and Japanese eyes it would both be Biden uh, because I know like the three languages like uh, 
the, the voting in my head is like, this is pronounced B-Den. And I have to tell myself it's Biden. It's like Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> Ninja Biden. You know what? If you asked him, it would take him a while to think of it because he's a thousand years old. <laughs> With his fists up? Yes. Oh, like Cornholio. <laughs> what a, that was. That was some yes. Stuff. Our president recently did a Cornholio impression on stage and it was very funny. Oh, what was he doing? I don't know. He thought he thought a lectern was there. But again, people who are 80 shouldn't be president. Yes. Uh, one final tweet from Ricky Muniz. <laughs> Uh, it, made in January of 2020 He says in 2002 I was nominated For a Golden Globe in 2020 I'm just sitting here staring in the mirror at my Balding head so you God know, damn man. he's got millions he's but he's still Very depressing. sad yeah yeah geez it's the Frankie a therapist take it to them Man that's also the hearing About a kid whose parents named him Thelonious it reminds me of the very Cringy thing of how uh, I forget which one of them, but it was one of the Ain't It Cool News reporters named their, their who, a white man with a white wife named his child Toshiro, mm. which I thought was uh, pretty cringy. I, I mean, thought. Henry and I have off the shelf white guy names from like 1934, <laughs> but when I walk around Berkeley, I hear some weird names being shouted out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure there's a Thelonious around here. One of the like the hippie mm-hmm. kids here. <laughs> it is fun being around families and hearing what the kids are named and the parents just shouting it angrily <laughs> uh also the i am pay that is a famous chinese american architect who lived a very very long time i've been in one of his buildings oh, really not not the javits center but i have been in the rock and roll hall of fame which was a, i think the one of the last things he oh, did i didn't his know that, firm did i didn't know the javits was his i missed yeah. that in the, okay then i've been in an i am pay building it's it's fine. It's a fine center to have a New York Comic Con in. Mm-hmm. I, I had a nice time in there. People were shocked he did the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame because it was him dabbling in something paying tribute to low art. <laughs> so there you have it. And yeah, oh, I like his buildings, so though. They look cool. Mm-hmm. He was an architect across seven decades, which is crazy. He lived to, uh, he died in 2019 at 102, which that's, that's impressive. And he was, he was working up until like very late in his years. He was designing stuff. Uh, and uh, then is the kids dance, which also is a scene and go of, uh, but it's a fantasy sequence of you know two people holding hands and spinning in a circle. Mm. That that happens with uh, with Manny and an unnamed uh, teller at the grocery store. Right, right. Oh, I wasn't <laughs> even thinking of that. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of that either. Yeah. I was thinking more of the the threesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh well sure there's that too it was uh it was Thelonious in bed with Linguo and Lisa <laughs> oh god uh I like to uh these are some of my favorite Al Jean commentary moments when he remarks that whenever he hears a song in something he knows how cheap it is to get that song and he talks about like if you ever hear the turtles happy together and stuff he's like that's in everything because it's cheap everybody mm. the turtles are easy to license <laughs> And they most like another NRBQ song in there. Yes, <laughs> Scully probably had to fight for that. Like, no, I can think of the perfect NRBQ song. NRBQ could cover "Happy Together." How about that? Get I'll him in here, him a call. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's funny that uh, I think I mean I looked at people taking apart the plot, and maybe there's a few shaky things. But I like how this is built into the the storytelling. And Lisa goes, "We've been spinning for hours," mm-hmm. which makes it so the timelines line up. The one thing they don't explain is that Bart and Milhouse have to have been inside of those caves for like four or five hours. <laughs> it's a but, it's a really long cave. Yes. Yeah. But plausibly, you can say, yes, the caves are that big. <laughs> you know, they call their shot right at the start. They show you that 7 a.m. sign and, you know, the episode ends at three and they do fit it in. And one thing Nina noticed about Go is that they show you a time at the beginning of the movie, but they don't ever show you times any time of other time in the movie. Yeah, that was weird. I thought they were going to uh, keep showing you the time in, in all three stories. But no, like it's just at one time. It's almost like they were planning on doing it and then they thought like oh this would just like cement too many things and um, it'll cause too many continuity errors so let's just take it out and they forgot to take out that one <laughs> yeah stamp. I think the biggest cheat is like I think driving to from LA to Vegas is um, longer than just a couple hours like how it appears in the movie but uh, yeah, it might be going really really fast sure okay I, I guess I don't know when I lived in Southern California people would go to Vegas all the time and treat it like a no big thing like okay. oh we're driving to Vegas this weekend all right maybe I'm thinking of just how long it is from like here to Reno and I'm, I'm associating <laughs> <laughs> similar California to Nevada trips Lisa realizes she's been spinning for hours and she must make the ultimate sacrifice it's 11 15 we've been spinning for hours I've got to get to my school and hand in linguo Oh, but I don't want to leave you. You must. You can't sacrifice grades for romance. That's not the girl I fell for. Will I ever see you again? Of course you will. At the Magnet High School. Now go. 
I just want to play the music just a little bit there too. I see. I just realized he says now go. Oh, oh yeah. Man. And they say go throughout the movie. Go. That's right. Well, the on the it's the go from the movie. Go. <laughs> I think Jay Moore has the has the titular uh, phrase and go the titular line and go. Sure, sure. I, but that's not the only time that's used in the movie. Henry, uh, you saw it. Uh, I the only one I'm thinking of is the is the Jay Moore one. I can't. I know. Yeah. I'm sure they do say go other times in it, but that's the only one that is coming to mind right now. I'm sorry to say. I, Every time they said go in that movie, they should have looked straight into the camera, <laughs> right down the barrels, isn't it? Hey. Pretty funny I said that, right? I wish she'd ended up with Thelonious, honestly. I don't like this. I, I love that he even just says, like, yeah, we're both going to end up at the Magnet High School in, like, seven years, and we'll date then. I, I I guess this is really just my way of, again, grinding my axe that I really hate that in future timelines they consistently write now that Lisa is with Millhouse. I just yeah. do not like that. No, I don't like that timeline either but in this in this one um i like that it was such a fleeting romance it almost felt like like a parody of like lisa's fleeting romances throughout the show <laughs> that's true i do like that. and all they do is spin in a circle yeah. uh and you know i will say in one of the most recent future ones they did where it was them revisiting the lisa becomes president story she is not married to millhouse in that one yeah like they which i appreciated i think they made it clear that she was a single woman as president which uh that that seems unlikely to happen in our lifetime. I don't know. I feel like you got to be married to be president. Yeah. People people already are looking weird at Cory Booker for wanting to run for president and being unmarried. And you have to pass as a Christian or it's not going to work. Of course that too. Yes. I know they reference it like once in like uh, one photo in the show, but they really need to give Lisa a girlfriend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. thing. <laughs> they need to go. You know, in that same future episode, they also say she has one girlfriend too. In that right. in, the, in the in the president one they just did in the last season. So yeah, they should just explore that more. Yeah, do do one set in when Lisa's twenty two and let us see Lisa's girlfriend she had. Like, let's give Lisa a girlfriend. Hashtag give Lisa a girlfriend. Though and I, she could be voiced by Zendaya. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> though, though also, Zendaya's in everything these days. Though also, I want to. I I still am living for the idea of Lee of Bart and Ralph having had a romantic history mm. as well in the future. I still want that to have happened. Uh, but anyway, yes, Lisa comes back to her Lola running, and you know what? Just like in Run Lola Run, she is running to towards where her dad is. So, oh yeah, yeah, that know? makes sense. There's there's a little there that Lisa's saying of it's noon. That's when Dad gets the brew shakes. That's uh, the dark acceptance of Homer's <laughs> alcoholism there. But but instead, she runs into Wiggum, who really is the glue for this entire episode. Mm -hmm. Everybody meets Wiggum. Chief Wiggum, can you drive me to school? It's an emergency. Uh, no can do, dollface. I got an informant wearing a wire. <laughs> Just like on Nash Bridges. <laughs> We're trying to get the goods on some smugglers. Why, I'd be delighted to sell you some illegally smuggled goods. That sounds like Fat Tony. Mm, only one way to be sure. <laughs> Fat Tony, is that you? Fat Tony? Hey, where's that voice coming from? This guy's wearing a wire. Take him out. My bad. <sighs> Can't work my answering machine either. <laughs> uh, now I need a new informant. Hey, say, Lisa, people trust you. How'd you like to be a snitch? The pay stinks, but... Oh. <laughs> Quick, Mo, March, cut off my thumb! Lisa! Mom, where'd you get that car? I stole it from McBain after I cut off your father's thumb. Can you take me to school, please? Not right now. Your father's in there and... Did you ever see that Blue Man Group? Oh, he's on the Blue Man Group again. Come on, we've got lots of time. Got lots of time? No, you don't, Marge. <laughs> you don't have lots of time. <laughs> uh, so the part with the, the part with Wiggum, it's it's such a good scene because it's funny enough on its own, and you think it's just like a throwaway gag that's not important to the plot. You would never imagine it's connected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, you it just reads as a joke of Wiggum gets someone killed, like, <laughs> and also that he thinks it's like Nash Bridges. Yes, which <laughs> I was going to say Nash Bridges info. Not too much about it. I mean, it, it's, it's a cop show with uh, Don Johnson and 
and Cheech Marin. Uh, it would have its final episode just a few days later on May 1st. Really? Yes. Wow. And guess what? If you're a patron, we can give you advance notice because the Nash Bridges revival movie airs November 27th. Whoa. If you're on the free feed, you missed it. This is uh, what you don't get if you're not a patron. <laughs> just in time for Thanksgiving to watch the Nash Bridges reunion together yeah. as a family. That's great. <laughs> I know Nash Bridges for two things. One, at the height of my pro wrestling fandom in the 90s, Steve, Stone Cold Steve Austin appeared on Nash Bridges. So I heard about that. And two, that it had a spinoff show starring Sammo Hung, which I actually watched a few episodes of called Martial Law. Oh, should have been yes. called Hung Jury. <laughs> And it was like it was just so fun my friends would make fun of him calling him chunky chan and i was like hey give sam hung respect he actually is jackie chan's like you know a uh, colleague and he's he's a very well respected uh, martial arts filmmaker but uh, but in america he was just like the heavy guy who does kung fu that's that's how he was right here yeah, I know. Not, I know nothing about Nash Bridges. Is that the name of a character? Yes, Nash Bridges is Don okay. Johnson. Yes, he's uh, he's a cop who doesn't play by the rules in in uh, Miami, I believe. There's a lot of cops that don't play by the rules. Apparently, <laughs> that's uh, too that's, many shows about them. Before that's every, most of cops, I think. Yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, before everyone had cameras, like it was considered novel. Like this cop breaks the rules. Wow, what an interesting character. Well, that's what like the Dirty Harry movies to begin with were born out of the perception that we're putting too many rules on these cops, and they're the bad guys are getting away with it and somehow you get to make a uh, a cop into a cool rule breaker even though it's again it's like eh, every single day we find out cops actually shoot people when they're not supposed to and it's not cool or or hip but I, uh, meanwhile, I prefer that Wiggum is just a loser cop who gets people killed, as, <laughs> as reality should re- <laughs> reflect. Lisa just running away from Wiggum is also a great response to it. And also, I really like that Marge says, I stole it from McBain, not Raimi or Wolfcastle. Because I was thinking, if in real life you say, stole something from Tom Holland, you, I would say, hey, I stole it from Spider-Man. <laughs> you wouldn't say Tom Holland. It'd be, it's mm-hmm. more fun to say sp- stole it from Spider-Man. No, it's, it's pretty realistic that way this is also like when they're able to say mcbain again right yes i guess that was a while back the mcbain rules have dropped i think uh it's still been pretty rare that they say mcbain out loud i think it was uh yeah it was uh when homer the mountain climbing homer episode in 10 that's when they saw a mcbain movie of him killing commie nazis that's when mcbain mm. finally got to be in the show again and so no one corrects you henry it's rainier with an n i i named that, after the beer i think that's why i said yeah i i've i've often been a rainier guy instead of a rainier guy but also i i'm sometimes not good at enunciating my words uh, as somebody who edits my own voice a lot i know <laughs> i i'm sick of, i i wish i enunciated better too so we're gonna go back I, and slip I didn't an n sound <laughs> rainier wolf castle so rainier wolf M? castle so i okay. in the past i have said it like rainier and not rainier yes uh but yeah marge drives off but uh, it instantly runs out of gas it's uh not so bad not so bad uh versus mama mia in it which uh, that gave me a good laugh abundanza is an actual italian word oh really it means plenty of oh that's fun haven't so. you heard it in your sopranos rewatch you know i hear them say the word schedule a lot and uh, a lot, i don't hear them say abundanza it's like giving me agita all that they don't go like more gabagool abundanza yeah, okay. abundanza <laughs> At Gabagool, you hear about Gabagool quite a lot. You do hear that. But no, he's usually mad that there's they're out of Gabagool, that they're, it's mm. the opposite of Abadanza Gabagool. <laughs> Uh, which it does, you know, it makes uh, that uh, that meat, that lunch meat look very tasty, of course. But that's uh, whenever you see Tony grab the gabagool, that's when he's upset. It's his coping mechanism <laughs> to eat gabagool. It's uh, it's thematic, guys. Uh, but so instead of reaching for the bottle, he reaches for the gabagool. Well, he reaches for the bottle as well. But yeah, when he goes oh. in many scenes where Tony goes like, ah, enough of this. He walks over to the fridge, opens it up and pulls out uh, mm. his handily ready gabagool. Cured uh, meat. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this is when that deleted scene comes in of uh, after Lisa and Marge get on the car. Then it cuts to the Abracathumbra. The name of the tick is Chester. That's the name of him. <laughs> And uh, we see that it's Dr. Nick's clinic for the next seven exits. For Marge and Lisa to be lost, they have to be crushed beneath a bunch of chicken coops, which I also, <laughs> I chuckled at that. Especially when Marge comes out with a chicken in her hair. I, I just like that visual. 
And Marge decides, well, I've borrowed one car today, so she's going to steal a second car. You know, for a penny and for a pound. Yeah. And uh, it's when they steal the second car, that's when the next, uh, the only other deleted scene on the DVD appears, which is Marge and Lisa driving away. This is when Marge sees a tick on her arm and goes, ah, and she's going to crush it. And then Lisa says, no, mom, that's Chester. (laughs) And Marge says, wow, you really know everybody. So they, they lost the Chester subplot in this episode. Yeah, I, I guess it has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the plot. So they were able to cut it out there easily. No room for Chester. Uh, and so then as uh, we're wondering, like, well, how's this scene going to end? Well, Bart comes out of a manhole cover and Marge is about to plow right into him. Wow. And the act ends. All right, so now Bart's day must begin. We're back with Son of a Diddly. You know, I I do wonder, why does Bart's alarm set go off specifically at 7.03? Is Hmm. that to get the extra three minutes of sleep in there? I I think this is after he's already hit the snooze button. Ah, okay. So I think it went off at 7, hit the snooze, three minutes later... Uh, that's when Krusty brings out the big guns, which is Itchy and Scratchy. Yes, the, I love the clockwork Itchy and Scratchy that come out to uh, attack his head with little mallets and axes. That's great. I a little baby it. axe. <laughs> <laughs> it's so cute. I also love any time where Krusty and Itchy and Scratchy cross over in promotional branding. I like that. And and it was certainly the age of the snooze alarm joke. The Homer already did the... In season 11, that was the first time I could find a joke about the snooze button of Homer pr- saying, need more snooze, and he pr- presses it and then sleeps for like uh 12 hours i think he does <laughs> bart jumps up and uh this is when we hear the third use of breakfast uh, the only one i have here in the clip as bart's day begins hey 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 lazy huh get him boys hey okay breakfast <laughs> it's millhouse and it sounds like he has big news. I found something awesome in the woods. Is it a dead body? It's cooler than a million dead bodies. <laughs> you take my sister's bike. Let's see, front door, back door, Skinner's, Flanders, your house. Ah, Lisa's bike. What's it like riding a girl's bike? It's disturbingly comfortable. And I saved, don't worry, we'll talk about that next line that comes after that, but I wanted to save that. But uh, Bart, uh, he's trying to show off to Millhouse that he's like, I could break into your house anytime I want. So you like that. (laughs) But also unspoken here is that Bart and Millhouse are choosing to skip school today. They're just not going to school. (laughs) Well, if something's cooler than a million dead bodies, I'm there. Yeah. Uh, but yes, Millhouse says he's disturbingly comfortable riding a girl's bike, which, you know, that made me uh, remind me of a thing from our friend's podcast, Drew Mackey, hmm. uh, on the gayest episode ever podcast for one of his Simpsons one, his most recent Simpsons one. He had on uh, two trans writers and podcasters. Uh, one of them, Henry Giardina, uh, who also uh, they interviewed me for an article, uh, Henry, the this other Henry, wrote about Drew's Simpsons every gay moment in simpsons ever video it was uh giardina who had gave to me the theory he thought of like do you think millhouse reads like someone who will transition Hmm. into being a woman later in life and this was one of uh giardina's uh top reasons of like just these moments and also millhouse going like oh what are big sisters for like just all these jokes that are obviously making fun of millhouse the the joke the intent of the jokes are millhouse is a little effeminate haha but i i i just thought it was interesting to hear from a trans hmm. writer who was like oh i actually theorized this shows that millhouse might you know transition later in life hmm. but anyway mm-hmm. i can see that reading yeah yeah also i i linked uh to a, a gif of the animation when he says that but there's crazy butt animation of millhouse when he says it's disturbingly comfortable oh it's not it's not there until he says that and that is it's almost like there's something in his uh the the seat of his pants going back and forth like mm. i guess that's his butt cheeks but they're not there until he says it's disturbingly comfortable wow you know it's very distracting to me <laughs> I never noticed that before, but you are, uh, it's now uh, so obvious to see when you showed us the image of it. Yeah. Feeling the seat with his butt. Yeah. With his buttocks. 
while like, pedaling like yeah it's it's him luxuriating in it as he says it's <laughs> disturbingly comfortable yeah the, but he doesn't shift his position yes but, yeah he stays in the same position but then something comes out of his butt and goes back and forth it's, he's got good control of his glutes yeah, yeah. i guess so. what's weird about this scene uh is that it's an adr line from bart but it just it just rephrases what bart says because i think the original line was like in a, in a commercial or something instead of him saying what's it like re- uh, riding a girl's bike he says how's that girl's bike treating you uh, so i don't know why they changed the phrasing because it wasn't a joke yeah it's interesting yeah <laughs> also um bill house on lisa's bike for a simpsons comic i did called uh, a pencil called for uh millhouse's guide to keeping it cool i had to draw millhouse on a girly bike and these scenes with millhouse on lisa's bike were great reference so uh, i just copied <laughs> lisa's bike and put it on there and i saw on instagram one day that someone got a tattoo of that exact millhouse drawing that i did oh wow that's so cool man so i my, remember my drawing of millhouse trying to look cool on a girl's bike has been <laughs> immortalized on and- everyone's skin it is a girl's bike because the uh, I don't know bike terminology, but the bar between the two uh, wheels bikes have wheels uh, is uh, at a downward pivot because, of course, as we all know, women only wear skirts. Ah, yes. And uh, if they wore if they rode a boy's bike, you could just see their legs. It would be the end of the world. But that that's why those bikes are. That's why a girl's bike is gendered in that oh. way or was. Well, also, like, uh, our hoop skirts wouldn't fit on a bike. Exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, if you were to be as so improper as to ride a bike as a woman anyway, then you, you at least need to keep your skirt lower. Uh, so then they arrive, and I I would say this is the most memed moment of the episode, wouldn't you guys say, at least these days? Yes. <laughs> How'd you find it? This is where I come to cry. Cool. <laughs> Wow, sax! Burlap sax! <laughs> it gets better! You're full of fireworks! Bottle rockets, frog launchers, weeping mamas, Tijuana toilet crackers! Three, two, one, gnomes blow up. So yes, this is where I come to cry. I've seen used numerous times on Twitter now, often to refer to Twitter as the place where people come to cry. And I think it's important that it's like not just somebody saying, this is where I come to cry, but that the response from Bart is like, cool. I I like any positive response Bart has to a very dark thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. It's better than uh, Bart making fun of Millhouse for it. I, it fits too in the recurring jokes that we spotted in in Drew Mackey's video of every gay moment. Where uh, after this episode, there were like two or three scenes where Millhouse seemingly is about to come out to Bart, and Bart like shuts it down, or he <laughs> just is like, "I don't want to hear any emotions from you, Millhouse." Like this is getting too real. <laughs> and this, I like Bart being a supportive friend. It just is cool. It's just like cool. Yeah, this is where you come to. Cry. But but I've seen people say like oh when I show people my Twitter account this is where I come to cry like I've I've seen that uh, a lot in the feed <laughs> and we also get one of the last uh, pro- great pre nine eleven jokes about how the military is full of wusses who are wasting money and they're not ready for war I love it the last got to be the last time yeah. I think yeah it's uh, from then on our all our soldiers are brave and powerful that's all the jokes you know no other joke can be made about them and we have to apologize to Dan Crenshaw if we make fun of him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's the second time I've been on an episode that features fireworks. Because my first time I was on Talking Simpsons, it was for Summer of Four Foot Two. Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Uh, I think the fireworks you're talking about, Nina, were the fireworks between us during that recording. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> uh, well, um, I already explained in that episode, but like in my city of Vancouver, it's a tradition to shoot off fireworks at home on Halloween night. Mm. And this this week, um, it's the week before Halloween. And uh, the, the week before Halloween is the only time it's legal to sell and buy fireworks. So you're only allowed to use them on Halloween. Wow. Until last year. They were finally banned. So this is going to be the first year <sighs> of the ban. Wow, man. And Halloween is uh, it's coming up, and I wonder how many people are going to adhere to the new rules. How many lawbreakers are you going to see? You know, in the I remember in the COVID uh, July 4ths, both of them, there were people like in, uh, in San Francisco and in the Los Angeles area I saw who made like drone shots of people, everybody in their backyard shooting off giant fireworks they really shouldn't be <laughs> doing, I especially think... in a powder keg of, of fire fires that can start all the time in the Bay Area. It's dangerous. I think this year's 
July 4th was especially full of fireworks because it was within the two week period we thought COVID was over. We're like, yes, we beat it. It's fireworks yeah, time, everybody. Celebrate. Yeah. Woo. And then uh, well, Hall- Halloween is a much safer time to shoot off fireworks, especially in Vancouver where it's constantly wet everywhere. Oh, well, it's sure. Had yeah. a lot of rain, especially this month. We've had it pretty dry until now. It's actually been a wet October for the first time. It feels like forever in, in Berkeley. Day. To make up for the the fireworks, the new fireworks ban, they are gonna put on like an uh, official fireworks show on Halloween night somewhere oh, here. That's good. I don't know if that's gonna quell the the thirst though. I think we're gonna <laughs> still see a lot of people shooting them off in their backyards. You know, I'm glad you mentioned Summer Four Foot Two t- as well because when we did that episode, I thought Tijuana Toilet Cracker was in that episode until we did it. I was like, oh, I guess that's later. Like it's it's such a great just descriptor of a giant. Uh, uh, firework you know uh, weeping mamas is a good one too because that's what will happen after <laughs> it blows up your child i suppose bart's plot bart's story is the most go like of the the three stories in this episode mm-hmm. yeah but not to make it gay again for millhouse but it is very similar to the scott wolf and jay moore <laughs> storyline yeah it feels like they always turn drugs into fireworks when they need to make something family friendly mm-hmm. uh, i remember the clerks cartoon where uh kevin smith pitched the cartoon abc didn't know that jay and silent bob were drug dealers when they found <laughs> out they're like you can't do this on our show <laughs> so instead they became quote unquote merry mischief makers and they would sell illegal fireworks instead of drugs mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember that uh and uh also this was the first time i caught that the gnomes are skinners like you see skinners yeah. mailbox i never i always just see the gnomes explode i never noticed skinners mailbox in the shot those are mother's gnomes <laughs> mother I, gnomes <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, man, that, that could have been used in this episode. Yep, yep, punching it up. I also the the bit of the rockets attached to a bike to make it go faster, basically doing like a real life version of the of a Wiley e. Coyote trick. I feel like after this episode, Jackass did that. I can't remember. I mm. know Jackass did rocket skates, but I think they did it for the bike as well. But. You know, Henry, I'll call you out for hypocrisy. Uh, you said that you couldn't handle Homer severing his thumb in this episode, and yet you're a Jackass fan. Uh, Frankly, I, uh, I don't understand. It. It, I can't it, watch Jackass. It's a nuanced. It's a nuanced world. I see. I it's, see. Uh, uh, I don't. For some reason, in a well, look. If they did a Jackass thing called like hand accidents that you don't in jackass they're doing stunts you expect to see, I see them hurt. I it's, see. Uh, you know there's uh, there's a difference there <laughs> also you're watching jackass with all your rowdy friends it's mm-hmm. uh, that, that's all your rowdy friends are coming over tonight <laughs> yeah. uh but no i contain multi i guess honestly <laughs> if i could explain my appeal of jackass it probably is because it came at the same time i was watching a lot of extreme wrestling and mm-hmm. so i could compartmentalize that violence into the pro wrestling section instead of into to, yeah for like horror movies not to say i never watch horror movies but i don't love them like i love the jackass hmm. you know i'll buy it uh speaking of things that were current at the time like jackass penis adjustment surgery we get a joke about that <laughs> it was it's all the rage then lengthening and a widening <laughs> Uh, as we know, McAllister needs a bit of both. But <laughs> though, again, I must say, uh, a canister being the when the lit, a thing gets lit on fire, it does not look like how the canister that is lit on fire in Act One looks. Mm. You know, it explodes differently. Bad continuity. Are we to believe this is some magic canister? I, I choose to think it's a second canister. You must have had two ether canisters that exploded. <laughs> You're like some kind of lingo, but for yeah. <laughs> cartoon continuity. We really are that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, yes, then uh, the kid the boys are running away as they hear the cops but uh, they have the foolish mistake of going into the real one two three fake street which is when they are caught in this next clip here we are one two three fake street the home of knifey wifey hey cheap can i hold my gun sideways it looks so cool (laughs) ah sure whatever you want birthday boy (laughs) okay drop the knife stabitha (laughs) great Grouchy's ghost. We've uncovered a hardcore cracker house. There's enough Chinese sky candy here to put you boys away for a long time. I can't go to juvie. They use guys like me as currency. Yeah, they'll pass you around like... Uh, like currency, like you said. <laughs> Maybe we can make you boys a deal. Your mission is to find the fireworks smugglers and get them to say something incriminating on this tape. Hootie and the Blowfish? Yeah, it's cheaper than blank tape. 
Ouch. Uh, take that, Hootie. Take that cracked rear view. You know you what? Know, Hootie, Hootie Fest is coming up. Ooh, it January is. January uh, 2022. Wow. Uh, they're having like some kind of giant concert along with Bare Naked Ladies, Blues Traveler, Spin Doctors, Better Than Ezra. They're Man. all of, of that era, I guess. Oh, boy. Where is this? I got to look up where this is. It's in Mexico, I think. Hmm. Well, all right. Man, now, it's not too far travel. I- <laughs> if you want to know where Hootie was at the time and his blowfish. Um, so at this point, their previous album was the 1998 album Musical Chairs, which still went platinum. But in 2003, that album would be the big bomb. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, they were fading to the point where a few years later, no one would care. I mean, but even by, still around. Mm-hmm. by 2001, they were already a joke. Yeah, the the hootie and the but I, I couldn't believe when I looked it up again, like how much did Cracked Rear View sell? 21 million copies. Yeah. Yeah. But like just from the song Hold My Hand Alone, they made enough money for like 18 lifetimes, the entire band. <laughs> the, back when that mattered, having a hit song like that. So March 20, uh, 21st is Lou's birthday, I guess. Oh, hmm. okay. It, 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 so it lines up with the Hootie way. Fest. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. That- so holding a holding a gun sideways is a. Uh- not good. <laughs> That's a, but it's a very Pulp Fiction, Tarantino-y type thing. It, it fits. Nobody in when people hold guns in Go, nobody does it the sideways way. But I, I think of it as a Pulp Fiction thing. Like certainly it was done in movies beforehand. But I think of Jules in Pulp Fiction pointing his gun that way in like the oh, poster. Oh, like a John Woo thing. You know, and John Woo, he double guns it. I guess he sorta. I've seen. Yeah, yeah. Chain Fat does it too. Yeah, that's true. I think a lot of movies are doing it at the time. Well, and certainly Tarantino yeah, like if, would have ripped ever, it off of, of John Woo movies, too. Yeah. <laughs> if you've ever fired a gun, you'll know um, holding it sideways is probably going to jack up your wrist and yeah. you can't aim properly. Man, I, I'm learning so much about guns here. Jeez. Nina and I have both fired guns, so watch out. <laughs> Not together or at each other. <laughs> have we mentioned this is the subplot for the movie, Go, with uh, Jay Moore and yes, Scott Wolf? This, uh, yeah. Yeah. Because they're actors who, you know, off screen were caught, you know, buying drugs. So now they're working as undercover cops to, uh, you know, on a sting operation. And they're wearing wires. Mm-hmm. And, and Although they make it fun ecstasy, yeah, yeah. And by by ninety nine, wires were not that big. It's like a, a comedy wire that Scott Wolf has to put on his balls. <laughs> uh, quite a batch on him there in that movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, though you know the movie, the the series, The Wire is just about to premiere at the end of two thousand one mm. or early two thousand two. Uh, also, this feels like the last time you could do a joke about a cassette tape in two thousand one <laughs> as well. And if I may do a comic nerd thing here, the uh, obviously great. Rucci's ghost is a reference to Great Caesar's ghost, which is Perry White's exclamation in many a classic Superman mm-hmm. co- uh, series. And of course, Grucci is a firework manufacturing company, so combos up the two there. Oh, I didn't know that. But uh, yeah, the great, great Caesar's ghost. What a wonderful exclamation! I, I still enjoy that. Uh, Grucci is uh, known to be a fireworks factor, uh, fireworks maker. It, yes. If you companies. asked me to name any kind of fireworks manufacturer, I'd be like, I don't know. No, I mean, I only I know that because I had to look it up. Me but too. I was like, and what's Grucci? Like, oh, Matt yeah. Sullivan said it on a commentary. So <laughs> the the boys are made into wire wearing snitches. They head into their tunnel, and this is when we run into uh, good old Fat Tony, Legs, and Louie. Great idea to smuggle fireworks, boss. Yeah, I was getting sick of running those unions. So much paperwork. Knock, knock. Excuse me. My friend and I were interested in purchasing quality fireworks. Yes, we are. Why, I'd be delighted to sell you some illegally smuggled goods. Fat Tony, is that you? Fat Tony? Hey, where's that voice coming from? This guy's wearing a wire. Take him out. (laughs) Whoa! My bad. (laughs) <laughs> oh i love that to find out that it's bar to get shot like if you if you're remembering act two of like wait the person who wears the wire gets shot we saw that happen with lisa like that also makes you very worried for bart in this section this too. is when uh bill house and bart run through the caverns for hours they sure do yeah well i mean you know it's on the outside of town and then they end up in the middle of town somehow somehow these caverns uh also connect to the sewer system uh, which is how bart comes out of a manhole cover but 
god and also we just did a whole thing about the sims uh the previous episode of simpsons safari is all about how much they hate unions now we got a joke about uh mm-hmm. you know the the mob runs the unions so much paperwork <laughs> yeah this uh you know this goes about as well as the wire does for the guys in go uh, also which man i love that sequence the sequence in the sarah Polly going to sell the drugs like that the, the tension in that scene is so good like how everything feels weird to her in the yeah. first version of it and you're like what's so weird here but yeah it does feel weird what's going on yeah i mentioned that like the three stories in go feel like wildly different stories but the third one is my favorite mm. Yeah, it's like the funniest the, one too oh yeah yeah and uh, it pays off so many things and uh and yeah i love i love that the jay moore's character goes from like helping sarah polly to then going like man she should just fucking die like it's yeah. such a what a trip he goes through. i don't want to spoil all ago sorry for like, if you haven't seen it yet listener but uh, yeah i i think the third act is the best of the three i will say go to amazon prime and yeah. rent it for three dollars <laughs> at uh, i think the vegas douches are the worst uh part of it even though it's it's still fun mm-hmm. but yeah you know in anything the second act is the weakest <laughs> even in this episode yeah yeah take that lisa <laughs> and also as uh you know i speaking of uh little animation things i had to like i was like going second by second i guess it can be read as bart grabs a lighter out of uh louis pocket but really he or sorry legs his pocket but bart pretty much has a lighter appear in his hand to light those firecrackers Mm. uh to cause the diversion but uh he kind of he like he wiggles around and has a hand near legs his pocket and then he has a lighter in his hand so i guess you could assume he pulled it out of his pocket but i'll buy it it's a bit of a fine i'll let it go (laughs) (laughs) and i i also like the animation of them running through uh the caves with sparklers out lighting it with sparklers i also like that you know what's interesting for this they could have brought back the lola music for this like it could have been the same it's also a running sequence but it's instead oh, yeah. they're just usual you know alf claws and running music i guess i it, think the lola yeah. stuff needs to stick to lisa mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah it, it's, 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 sense with her. it's one person running that i associate that music yeah. with that's true yeah the boys get cornered uh they're about to be shot like fat tony is going to murder two children right here <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and this is uh, they ask shoulder or ankle which uh, you know surprised me Louis chooses ankle legs picks shoulder uh, just to let the record reflect that when they run away the mobsters have to stand below them for about 20 seconds for this yeah. to work here as well they, they let them go up the ladder like let's see where this is headed let's say the fat tony was just very slow going up a ladder mm-hmm. he is he is quite big you know there's he, no mob stuff in go but there are mob like guys mm-hmm. with yeah. guns yeah the strip people. club guys are basically mob guys but yeah yeah <laughs> bart and millhouse they are going up top bart comes out top and i love for all of the drama that they put at the end of act three marge just stops and it like lightly taps the back yeah. of bart's head that's great <laughs> i love that he's just annoyed like ow <laughs> mom so the boys run away run one more time lisa and marge are witness to them being chased and uh it's almost d- d- marge is about to watch her child be murdered in front of her and so she is desperate desperate enough to throw a robot <laughs> oh you ain't going nowhere you leave those boys alone <laughs> He's throwing robots. They are throwing robots. It's disrespecting us. Shut up, you face. Shut up your face. <laughs> What's the matter, you? You ain't so big. Me and him are gonna whack you in the Labanza. Mm, uh, bad grammar overload. Error. Error. <laughs> what the hell? <gasps> Linguo. Dead. <laughs> <laughs> you know uh, lingua should be more open-minded about dialects that's yeah, what i have to say yeah honestly it's italian american discrimination yeah you know uh, uh at least didn't have time to program that in that's true she'd have been more sensitive if she had just given a little more time she'd have been more culturally sensitive i think no colloquialisms <laughs> but yeah the they's throwing robots i love that i i, also I, I li- like when lingua sits up to correct them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> also that lingua yells when he's thrown <laughs> he, oh. he knows he's thrown yeah that's great and yeah 
yeah, this is the height of the Sopranos popularity, so it's a time to make fun. Like, season three of Sopranos, I was watching live on HBO the same nights as these episodes. Like, it would it was a good chunk there. Eight o'clock, Simpsons. Eight thirty, Malcolm in the Middle. Nine o'clock, switch over to uh, HBO to watch the uh, the Sopranos. Though actually, I guess it was really Sex in the City and Curb, then Sopranos hmm. at ten. That was that Italian was Italian mobsters number. had never been more popular. <laughs> I'm telling you guys, I know I sound like every cliche in the world. It really is the best show. <laughs> I love the show hmm. so much. It's only better with time. If I see you buying cigars, Henry, I'm stepping in. <laughs> uh, well, what's funny about the show is I watch it now. It's like, oh yeah, I was exactly AJ, like AJ Soprano, his shitty little son who's just an annoying jerk kid who's like mom you're on the internet i was like oh yeah that was me this <laughs> i don't think any show in 1999 more perfectly captured uh how annoying 13 year old suburban white kids were and i think she did uh, that show does it well i know i ragged on on you about this on twitter but i just want to say it was, it was funny when you guys were like oh you should they should let people uh smoke on tv uh and in movies like uh, it doesn't make people want to smoke and henry was was like yeah and then three minutes not three minutes later he's like oh i started watching sopranos and i really like it and it made me start drinking whiskey <laughs> and actually now that i think about it i think my dad started smoking cigars because of the sopranos <laughs> when it i does make an impression on you when i just rewatched the fifth season premiere of sopranos and tony takes out his little like metal tube that you unscrew your fancy cigar out of to take a few puffs which i saw my dad exactly do back <laughs> then i was like oh yeah he did just do it because of this but you should not emulate tony soprano or james gandolfini <laughs> No, both no, no, dangerous no. lifestyles. Yes. Uh, my unlike Gandolfini, my weight loss has been going been going down instead of up over the years, as as he does on the series. But you know, Bob is supportive of my whiskey. After doing that podcast, Bob is a birthday gift to me. Bought me some very nice whiskey and a whiskey uh, measuring cup as mm -hmm. well for it, so I can have the correct shot amount. And when I make my highballs at home, I can I can measure it out correctly. All right, he got you some good stuff. <laughs> so you don't have to drink Jack Daniels. Uh, when I drink the Suntory brand, I'm just like, oh man, I'm I'm just like the, yeah, I'm yeah, just like Yakuza and Yakuza. <laughs> but yes, the the Italian mobsters they all get blown up. Homer runs real fast from where he is to get to that alleyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I also I had a little chuckle at the funny drawing of Bart and Milhouse hugging each other inside of the uh, the trash can for mm -hmm. safety. That's it's a cute little drawing. Uh, but uh, yeah, Homer ran back. He sees Lingo is destroyed he kept his thumb is now in his pocket which is like ah this this thumb is trash now really it's it's not coming back hey on. it's the magic of mob uh, doctors they can just do anything uh and yes we have a happy ending for everyone here oh thank goodness everyone's okay except your thumb and lisa's science project i couldn't help but notice your respective <laughs> predicaments perhaps i may offer a bipartite solution You go enjoy your thumb as the circulation returns the subject prepares for a long and painful recovery <laughs> it's lucky for me that legs was an experienced mob doctor he once pulled a slug out of my arm and inserted it into a stoolie's brain that's a first place science project lisa Yay! boy this sure was one crazy day huh? right mr teeny <laughs> that's the only downer of this episode i set it up front but it's mr teeny saying tell the people this plot made no sense which you you worked very hard to do this why are you crapping all over it at the end it, it, it all worked yeah. even yeah. people on the internet could barely find anything wrong with the plotting i was like you've had like way worse endings than this why why this one you're uh you're saying this makes no sense it's not true it feels it like makes perfect sense an elder statesman on the writing staff uh just stepped in and said we have to put this on here because otherwise what if we're wrong yeah. i think that's one of those times where again it feels like the simpsons lacked confidence you know mm -hmm. they should have had the confidence certainly selman on the commentary is very confident i don't think it was his call i think i think they say that that was a replacement that originally it was like him saying like i have rabies or i have ebola, uh, ebola. Yeah. yes but actually on the commentary they were, they actually disagree with mr teeny they said no this plot does make sense why did we put that in there and yeah. i think somebody says i think he said something 
something about Ebola before. Uh, they they should have had the confidence to just say like, yeah, this episode does make sense. But they this was the opposite of them rubbing something in the face of uh, the commenters on the internet. This was them saying like, I'm sure the people on No Homers are going to tell us that we messed it up and it doesn't make sense. So let's just have Teeny say it now to to get ahead of the curve. You know, yeah, this is why no matter what dumb thing you do, you got to do it with full confidence. Mm-hmm. I agree. Full. You can apologize later when it's over if you did make a mistake, but exactly. have the confidence then when you do it. This insecurity is now part of this episode forever, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and that sucks because it's a great episode. Yeah, and it, it's the, an unfortunate thing at the very end too. I, I wish it wasn't that. Especially, I love the drawing of Marge. <laughs> Marge saying, "Boy, we sure had a that was one crazy day, right, Mister Teeny?" Like that's <laughs> such a funny drawing. We get we get two downers at the end. We have uh, Mister Teeny's uh, bad line of dialogue, and also fake Miss Hoover, the non Maggie yes. Roswell Miss yeah. Hoover. Uh, bad taste in my mouth. Also, Homer moves his thumb instantly as soon as it's reattached, which, uh, as as you, I'm sure, can assume, uh, that is not accurate. It says it'll take a lot of, usually, a lot of physical therapy in about 12 weeks before you're moving your thumb again, even a little bit. Lisa, I like how Lisa, she, like, shrugs off the magic of this by saying, you know, the slow and painful recovery yes, that will follow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Though, uh, the time frame does work. If you take that Homer got his finger cut off at nine and it got reattached at three, the internet does tell me that up to six hours you're probably gonna be able to save the thumb it says and so homer was really at the last second there there's a a video on youtube that has all three parts playing next to each other at once to show the entire day oh neat Hmm. oh i should check that out yeah it's by youtuber multiple aj's okay look that up I look that up. I, All the audio plays at once too, so just be, be <laughs> the uh, cacophony there. Last thing about this scene here too uh, is that Tony admits to murder in front of witnesses, including a police officer. Nobody, <laughs> nobody really cares about him shooting a stoolie in the brain. <laughs> I, I gotta wonder what they get out of this. Mm, I guess the... If they help her with her project, then they don't get charged with anything? DeBart and Milhouse not struck? press charges for their uh, the, the to Fat Tony trying to kill them, I guess, I suppose. Hmm. Mr. Tini is right. <laughs> okay. Take everything back. <laughs> Yeah, this episode. No, it's fine. I don't care. Like I said, uh, a lot, a lot of fun has been had on this, uh, on these recent seasons with how little they care. I mean, it, they they like to joke about it. it's like we've been going on for so long. What else do you want us to do? So often it'll be a fun shrug. Mm. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes they frustrate us. They frustrated us a lot more twenty years ago. But it was cool to see them actually care about plotting and having the plot matter. And that's why this stood out then, and it stands out now doing this podcast. Where again, people are getting tired in <laughs> in these seasons. Yeah. I I've said it before on here for examples of me getting to the end of just the Simpson Safari and going like so they all have diamonds now or or the end of the scams episode where they just all start surfing yeah it's just like surf party like moments that just shove you in the face of like haha we don't care and you can't make us I had the opposite reaction when I watched this the first time because even then I didn't stand up and say this definitely makes sense but I did think like wait why is Teeny saying this I thought this made sense Mm -hmm. like it I had the complete opposite reaction the way teeny talks is how he should have said at the end of most episodes yeah. the angry reaction i had like, uh, in 2001 missionary impossible let's say yeah yeah after watching go i'm even more impressed by this episode because the stories intertwine more and and timeline wise they may not fit together perfectly like bart and mihel's being chased for three hours <laughs> it still works and uh this actually heightened my expectation for the movie go <laughs> because i thought that movie was going to be more like this episode Instead, they all veer into like wildly different directions. This one, it's more, yeah, like I said, more intertwined, which makes me want to see an episode that's actually based on Run, Lola, Run, where it follows one character and we see the same day three times where they do something different each time. And uh, like I can picture Lisa, like say, bumping into Bumblebee Man as she runs past him and then you see like, flashes <laughs> of what the rest of his life would be like. So that could be fun to play with. Yeah, you know, I wish they had done that. Uh, if there's one joke they should have stolen from it to put in the movie when I, uh, the, just, yeah, the Polaroid flash forwards. Like, just do do that one time where she bumps into like Barney or whatever and it's him dead in a ditch or something. <laughs> Maybe they thought that would ex- be a little too confusing. Yeah. If you haven't seen the movie. That's true. That's true. And in, in both those cases, they're like, ah, nobody saw this movie. It only 
it only made like a, a million dollars or whatever. So I, I can yeah, understand that. You can still understand this run, run uh, reference in this episode without having seen the movie. Like, what do you know about that movie? It's about a, a woman who runs to cool uh, German techno music. Yeah. That's all you see in this. That's I mean, all you need. I hadn't seen it at the time and I knew the reference. Mm-hmm. I, I unfortunately... Also- it it left it was too big of a reference because now people think that's what this episode is when it, it's not. And Matt Selman will call you a dummy. I also have to give credit to Matt Selman. Al Jean still won't reference a movie as young as a 1999 film. Like he won't only reference <laughs> movies that are older than 1970. And so if, even now, having a go reference to, in a 2021 episode would feel relatively fresh compared to the many Breakfast at Tiffany's episodes that. Uh, that Al Jean is done. He's yeah. done at least two, at least two Breakfast at Tiffany's ones, or the one that puts Homer in Atticus Finch's role in To Kill a Mockingbird. It's oh, you like, mean Atticus Finch? Ugh, don't don't remind me. <laughs> <laughs> this this shows the um, relative youth that Matt Selman brings to the show, and one of the more positive things about modern Simpsons mm-hmm. uh, that that Selman brings, I'd say. Oh, and yeah, I guess officially best episode of season 12. Oh, definitely. Say, Maybe the yeah. best episode of Mike Scully's uh, run. Maybe. You're calling it now? <laughs> Maybe. You know, I won't, I'm going to have to double check the list one more mm. time to say that for sure. I don't count uh, episodes from his run that were show run by Mike, uh, sorry, by David Merkin or Oakley and Weinstein. Oh, certainly not. I Those are different. That, that would be underhanded. Yes. I wouldn't go that way. <laughs> But yes, thank you for joining us on our show, Nina. Uh, Please let us know where we can find you online and what you're working on. I know a new book is coming out that you are the artist behind, too. Yeah, that's uh, Sparks Future Perfect. That's purr as in the the cat noise. Drawn by me, Simpsons Comics artist me, (laughs) and written by Simpsons Comics writer Ian Boothby. And that's coming out March 1st, 2022. It is after Hootie Fest. (laughs) Uh, This was entirely drawn during the pandemic. Oh, it was. Yes. Yes. And I'm on Twitter as Space Coyote. That's Space Coyote with an L at the end instead of an uh, an E. SpaceCoyote.com is my website if you want to see my artwork. If you go to Fangamer.com, go to Collections, Sort by Artists, Space Coyote, you'll see all the latest stuff I've designed for games like Ghost of Tsushima, Mega Man Legends, and Deltarune Chapter 2. I'm also on the Talking Simpsons Discord way too much. <laughs> uh, so say hi to me on there. She's modding on there, so uh, if you insult us... I'm not a us, mod. I don't have mod privileges. Uh, well, we'll talk about that. <laughs> mod privileges. <laughs> it's hard thing to do. <laughs> And uh, yeah, you're you. I own several of your shirts. Uh, my husband actually just bought your Garrus one from Mass Effect, the uh, the Archangel one. Oh, that's on uh, Sanshi.com. Mm-hmm. Ah, okay. I'm yeah. wearing one of your Undertale shirts right now. <laughs> that's from Fan Gamer. Mm-hmm. A wonderful shirt smith, this Nina Matsumoto. But but th- but yes, thank you, Nina. It's always great to have you back. So thanks again to Nina for being on the show. Please check out all of her stuff. And as for us, if you want to check out more of what we do and get all these episodes one week at a time and ad free, please head on over to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Sign up there. You'll get just that and also access to everything behind the $5 paywall. That is all the exclusive podcasts we've made for the past four and a half years of this Patreon, which includes all of our limited miniseries. The most recent one we're doing right now. It's currently unraveling. That is Blab about Batman, the animated series. We're going over our 10 favorite episodes of Batman, the animated series with research and clips everything you love from our podcast and only five dollar and up patrons can get that at patreon.com slash talking simpsons through the end of 2021 10 new episodes and there is a ten dollar level as well on the patreon when you sign up for that you get access to all the five dollar stuff but also access to one huge mega long podcast once a month only for patrons of that level or higher what is that podcast henry Bob is talking about the What a Cartoon Movie Podcast. If you're a listener of Talking Simpsons, you no doubt know that we have a sister podcast where twice a month on What a Cartoon Podcast, we talk about an animated series super in-depth. Well, once a month we cover an animated feature film, but only for our premium patrons at patreon.com slash talking simpsons. If you sign up at that $10 level, you get all the $5 things Bob just talked about, but you also get the What a Cartoon Movie, where we cover animated feature films like... This month, we're covering Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the 1964 Rankin-Basque holiday classic. The month before that, Batman Beyond Return of the Joker, one of the best Batman cartoons there ever was. A giant back catalog, three years worth, I would dare say over 200 hours of exclusive What a Cartoon Movie podcast, in addition to the over 100 episodes of other Patreon exclusives there. Sign up today to check it all out. Go to patreon.com slash talking simpsons. 
So as for me, I've been one of your hosts, Bob Mackey. You can find me on Twitter as Bob Servo. I also have another podcast, by the way, that is called Retronauts. It is a classic gaming podcast all about old video games. Find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts. Sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month. And Henry, how about you? You can follow me on Twitter at H-E-N-E-R-E-Y-G. And also, if you're following me and Bob on Twitter... Follow the official Twitter account of this podcast at Talk Simpsons Pod. If you follow at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter, you will be up to date whenever there's news on the Patreon, on the free feed, whenever there's a poll, whenever we announce something like a live show, you might hear about it first. No, you will hear about it first at, at Talk Simpsons Pod on Twitter. Follow it. Thank you so much for listening, folks. We'll see you next time for the latest episode of our community podcast, Talk to the Audience, and we'll see you then. wizard friends went straight to hell for practicing witchcraft. Yay! What the diddly-o?